director of uh, ENI Enrico Mattei Foundation. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the ENI Enrico Mattei Foundation International Conference on Methodologies and, indi and Indicators for Green Growth Measurement. As many of you already know, every year we provide an overview of the most updated findings of the Sustainability Index developed by Fondazione Eni, INI Enrico Mattei Foundation, the theme SI, Sustainable Indicator. This annual date has become a great and unique occasion to invite distinguished international experts as speakers opening the discussion to the state of the art in quantitative measurement of sustainability. Since its beginnings, the ENI Enrico Mattei Foundation has focused its attention on this topic and has invested the resources towards the development of sustainability accounting. When I arrived here as a junior researcher in 1991, I was given the difficult task to study environmental national accounting as a member of a group of experts coordinated by the Italian National Institute of Statistics. I remember that even then, we had to face with a couple of problems which proved to be not so trivial. The first question was to what extent we had to include the environment in green GDP calculation and how to give a market value to the environment, which is typically a public good. The second crucial question was how to persuade public decision makers to fully understand the green GDP, the meaning of green GDP and to use it as main indicator for public policies assessment beside the traditional GDP. As regards the first question, surely we have made an important progress since then. We have moved from environmental accounting to sustainability indexes, replacing a national account framework with more flexible and easy to aggregate indicators. But overall, we have moved from an environmental based approach to a sustainability approach, sustainability based approach, including the social dimension in the composition of the main index, following the most relevant literature on sustainable development. Indicators as education, corruption, life expectancy, and food are now usually aggregated with more traditional environmental and economic indicators. As regards the second problem, as far as I know, the opportunity to use these new sustainability indexes for policies assessment has not been taken and remains in the background, unfortunately. But maybe I'm outdated. This is why I would like to have your valuable opinion on this point. Now, moving to the end of my welcome speech, let me thank Carlo Carraro and all the film staff who have been working to prepare this event. It is not easy to design and execute an event like this and I'm grateful to them for their work and the enthusiasm they have put in this project. In conclusion, let me thank all speakers who accepted to help us address a very complicated but interesting issue and foster, I hope, a lively debate. I wish you a fruitful conference and a pleasant stay at Yenai and Ricomate Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your words and for all the support you provided to this uh, to this project. Uh, let's uh, start the works of this um, of this morning session. 
uh, as you see from the program, uh, the presentation of the results uh, of our indicator or system of indicators um, will be postponed at the end of the, of the session. And the reason is that uh, this time we really wanted to learn rather than uh, to, to show what we did, to learn from other experiences, from other, from other institutions who have been working, which have been working on, uh, on, uh, on measurements and indicators of green growth. And this is why I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to have here both, both Paul uh, Streyes and, and uh, Marianne Fay because their institution, the OECD, and the World Bank have been leading the research in, in, uh, in this field. And uh, among other things, uh, they, they established the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. And within the Green Growth Knowledge Platform, there is a committee working on, uh, on, on uh, measurement indicators of green growth, which is uh, working exactly in the same direction as we have been working for the last five, five years to provide, to provide our system of indicators, of course. We have one system of indicators, there are many others, and uh, we would like to compare the, the efficiency of our work with, uh, with, the, with the efficiency of others and the, the research directions that we are pursuing with those that we have been pursued by, by other institutions. Um, what we did is, is peculiar uh, because uh, rather than uh, uh, creating a system of indicators uh, looking at the past, so computing, uh, what uh, different countries or regions uh, did in the past in terms of green growth. We are trying to uh, move forward and uh, look forward by um, linking a system of indicator with the model, and the model is able to generate those indicators, and therefore we can uh, uh, project the values of the indicators into the future and look at what will happen in terms of sustainability in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years uh, from, uh, from now. This is quite a, a useful exercise because it provides consistency across indicators. It avoids duplication across, uh, across indicators. And also, it gives an idea of the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, of the green growth because, of course, green growth is a dynamic concept by definition. And green growth uh, uh, should therefore be assessed in terms of evolution in the coming decades rather than, uh, than, uh, rather than uh, evolution in, in the past. Uh, of course, the past is important. The past is important to check uh, the validity of the model, uh, but uh, the uh, progress toward, toward uh, sustainable development or towards green growth should be measured with respect to the, to the future. Uh, dynamics of these different of the different economies we are assessing. So, uh, I I think that our approach has some 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 merits, but of course uh, uh, there are other approaches, and it's important to compare what we did uh, with uh, with the other ones. This is why we structure this morning session with uh, four contributions, three from. Um, from institutions, uh, as I said, that have been working, uh, been working on these issues, like, like the, the World Bank and the, and the OECD. Uh, the European Commission is also, is also working, has been working in particular in, in ISPRA on, uh, on, these, uh, on, on this kind of research. And, uh, and uh, Michela Saizana will join us in a few minutes. Uh, uh, she's the fourth speaker, the, the missing one for the moment, but uh, no, she, she's arriving, she'll, she'll be here. So we will have uh, three different views, and then we will propose our, our own results. Uh, and you will be able to compare, to compare the, these different approaches, these different ways of, uh, of dealing with, with this issue. Uh, this, this is why uh, uh, the, the participation of, of uh, Marianne and, and Paula is, is, uh, is very important. I'm quite glad to both of them for, for being here. I'm quite grateful uh, uh, to all of you for your participation. And at the end of the presentation, you will have time to raise questions uh, and, uh, and uh, make comments, raise doubts, uh, remarks, uh, whatever. So in interactions uh, with you will also, will also be quite, quite important. Uh, let me then start by giving the floor to, to Paul. Paul Schreier is the Deputy Director of Statistics Directorate of the OECD and has a large experience on all, on all what we are going to say the, this morning. And I thank him uh, for uh, his participation today. Thank you. Of course. Uh, well, thank you very much, Carlo, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure 
being here and interacting with you on this uh, important and interesting topic. Uh, what you have uh, before you is a little presentation that deals with sustainability, but really what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at some of the work that the OECD has been undertaking, undertaken in a number of areas, and uh, it is not always clear how these uh, things hang together. Uh, for example, some of you may have uh, encountered the OECD's work on measurement of well-being, where actually my former director, Enrico Giovannini, who is now in Italian politics, was quite uh, uh, actively involved in, in launching. Uh, uh, there's a lot of work ongoing on green growth. We've just heard about this uh, in, under the cover of the Green Growth Knowledge Platform and together with uh, the World Bank. And we do have separate work on sustainability as well. And so if you go to the OECD the website, you may ask, well, how does this actually hang together? Um, so what I'd like to do is to present a little bit how these things hang together conceptually. And that will give me the opportunity to talk uh, as well about the measurement issues that arise there and some of the things that we do and some of the things that we don't do uh, at uh, the OECD. I should add that uh, my uh, perspective is really one of a, a, someone from a, from a statistical directorate, and so a statistical perspective, I am not talking from a modeling perspective, which is quite different and uh, immensely interesting as well, but th this is not something I will be covering. Some of my colleagues at the OECD deal with uh, long-term modeling as well, but I'd like to focus on the more statistical uh, side here. So uh, how do these uh, various aspects uh, hang together? How do we measure well-being and sustainability, and what are the main measurement issues? Those are the uh, questions I will address in the remaining time. The basic idea how things hang together is actually quite easily explained. Uh, if you think about our objects of measurement, it's <coughs> really at three different levels. The first level is uh, about trying to get a handle on the measurement of current well-being. I'll explain a bit more how we do this and what comes out of it. Uh, but the idea is to identify uh, certain domains that uh, we consider being important for people's well-being. Uh, and we have an approach uh, where we try to develop measure, measures that are oriented at households. So we're not looking at the economy as a whole. We're looking at households and individuals. We're looking at indicators that reflect outcomes rather than inputs. So for example, when we look at health, we look at health outcomes, not at health expenditure or the number of doctors around. Uh, and uh, a very important feature of this work, we look at distributions. So averages are fine, but uh, not only for income, but also for the other dimensions, you'd like to get a sense of how things are distributed across households or the population. This is our work on well-being. Uh, I'll say a bit more about it in, in a second, but uh, to retain here, uh, what you should retain here is that we are trying to, to capture current well-being. So there's no kind of sustainability uh, issue uh, involved uh, immediately. The second level, and this is really where green growth comes in, is the level where we try to get a handle through indicators uh, on the interactions between the environment and the economy. So uh, this is where you will uh, have indicators of environmental resource productivities, also uh, economic opportunities arising uh, from green growth. And this is the work on green growth. Again, I'll give you a few examples in a minute to put a bit of, of uh, flesh uh, to this. And the third level is uh, really about sustainability. When we try to say something about how well-being in a very broad sense can be sustained over time. This uh, almost uh, by necessity, when you come from an indicators approach, uh, turns around the notion of capital. Uh, I mean, sustainability is uh, very closely linked to the idea of some form of capital that you'd like to pass on to future generations and that li you'd like to sus sustain. So the measurement issues in conjunction with sustainability are essentially measurement issues about different types of uh, capital. 
And again, I will give you some uh, examples of what is going on there. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the economic literature on the theory of uh, intertemporal welfare accounting will actually see that uh, those three levels correspond to the typical structure of uh, intertemporal models uh, of uh, welfare measurement, where you have kind of current measurement of current utility, the interactions between stocks and flows, and then the intertemporal uh, value functions that come in. Now, let me say a few words about the measurement of current well-being. I already described some of the features that we're trying to follow up here. Um, we are operating with 11 dimensions. Uh, three of them are summarized under heading of material well-being. Those are income, jobs, and housing. And uh, eight of them are summarized under the heading of quality of life. Uh, and you have uh, the list here. It goes from health uh, to personal security and is uh, complemented by measures of subjective uh, well-being as well. We have been uh, uh, compiling indicators for OECD countries uh, on those 11 dimensions, and we just a few days ago released the second issue of our publication, How is Life?, which brings together the newest indicators uh, in this field. Uh, so we look again how the situation is in 2013. We have been looking at the cost of the financial crisis along those uh, dimensions. Uh, there's a special chapter on well-being on the work, in the workplace and uh, gender gaps in well-being. So I'm, I'm now closing this parenthesis of uh, the promotional uh, uh, moment. Uh, uh, but you can get to the uh, OECD website and get hold of this uh, 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 publication as I speak, basically. Uh, now, <coughs> I will not go into the results of this, but just to give you a gist of the approach that we have. So we measure the countries along those 11 dimensions. We do not aggregate across the 11 dimensions in any particular way, for reasons I will explain in a second, but we do have kind of summary indications of where countries come out simply by counting uh, the number of times uh, where countries perform well along those 11 dimensions, where they perform kind of on average, and where they perform less well. And uh, if you uh, count the number of good performances, bad performances, medium performances, you get the type of picture that I have uh, here before me. And so one of the things that we find, for example, is that even though some countries are doing better than others along those 11 dimensions, there's really no single champion that is among the top countries in all 11 dimensions. And there's no single countries, a country that is among the least well performers in all, uh, in all dimensions. And then, of course, there's a lot of interest in going into the various dimensions and looking how countries perform uh, along them. But the basic idea is to get some uh, sort of indication about uh, these 11 dimensions that characterize current well-being. Um, as I said, we don't really construct a composite index across those 11 dimensions. The uh, reason is simply that it is somewhat costly to establish the weights. Uh, when I say costly, I mean costly for an organization like the OECD, where uh, when you want to establish weights to aggregate between you know, health and education or security, uh, you necessarily have to bring in some normative judgments. And uh, it is not obvious how to do this in an international organization. Uh, so the way we've been uh, dealing with this is uh, that we have put the information of the 11 indexes to everyone's disposal. And if you go to the OECD website and you go to the Better Life Index, you can actually put in your own weights okay, and then see how country rankings come up. So basically, you use your own preferences to uh, see how uh, they play on the uh, comparison of OECD countries. But it's not the OECD that tells you, you know, uh, how you should value those uh, uh, components. There's a little exception here on our work on inclusive growth. Maybe I, I won't have time to uh, get into this, where we do have actually a, an explicit way of aggregating across 
uh, dimensions, uh, but those are much fewer dimensions, and there's a special kind of uh, theoretical basis uh, for doing so. But on the whole, we, we refrain from constructing one single aggregate measure of well-being. So here's just a link to the Better Life Index, and I invite you to uh, go there and uh, look it up. Um, so th this is basically about measuring current well-being. As a, this has nothing to do yet with uh, sustainability because uh, it is, uh, how should I say, part of our philosophy is that is we, we think it is just more pragmatic and practical to disentangle the measurement of current well-being from the measurement of sustainability because trying to do both at the same time to get a handle on many dimensions that affect people and how they may be sustainable over time is a very tough uh, a job uh, uh, statistically and even conceptually to uh, think it through. So let me turn to the second level, which is really about green growth and the interactions between the economy and the environment. If you want some sort of, the, uh, if some sort of effort to uh, get a handle on the structural relations in the, in the economy. Our green growth uh, indicators are constructed out f around four different groups. The ones uh, that are particularly interesting from this environment economy interactions is the, probably the first and the fourth one. Uh, the first one is uh, about the environmental and resource productivity of the economy. I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, and the fourth one is about economic opportunities and policy responses. Our work on green growth is very much targeted to the policy angle, so we're trying to link it back to uh, providing policy uh, advice uh, from, the, uh, from the indicators. On the right-hand column, you see some examples of more specific topics that are being picked up under those uh, areas uh, uh, and uh, I will not uh, read them out, but you, you, get a, you get a flavor of what this is about. I'll just like to show uh, <coughs> one or two examples that uh, emerge in this work on uh, uh, the structural relations. Here, by the way, you have uh, our Green Growth Indicators uh, publication. And uh, uh, one of course, one classic indicator that nearly everyone uses when looking at uh, the environment-economy relationship is uh, some sort of uh, emission intensity, or as we say, uh, CO2 productivity. It's basically intensity uh, the other way around. Uh, and uh, this is what we do as well. Uh, the innovation that we have in this area is uh, that we are not only looking at what is called the production-based uh, CO2 emissions per uh, unit of GDP, but also at the demand-based uh, uh, emissions per unit of GDP. What is the difference? The difference is that when you look at the production side, you measure the emissions where they uh, emerge and uh, compare them with uh, that country's GDP. Now, if you have a situation, as is not uh, implausible, where actually some of the production is taking place abroad and the final goods and services are then re-imported and consumed uh, in OECD countries, you do observe, of course, that uh, uh, or that would lead to a decline in the uh, pro production-based emis emissions uh, because the CO2 happens somewhere else, but really uh, the goods and services are demanded and consumed uh, domestically. So uh, what we are doing is we are computing uh, the uh, direct and embodied uh, CO2 that uh, is in our goods and services that are being uh, consumed, including those that are being imported. And uh, you find that it changes the picture that you get from CO2 intensity internationally. The a graph that you have before you shows the growth of this CO2 emissions uh, over uh, uh, 10 years of time for the OECD countries and uh, for the emerging economies, so uh, Brazil, Russia, Ind India, Indonesia, China, and South Africa. And you see that uh, the bars uh, move uh, 
around as you move from a production to a demand-based perspective. In particular, the growth of emissions for the BRICS uh, is uh, lower as you look at the demand-based uh, perspective as opposed to the OECD countries. So in a way, the net tra trade balance in uh, CO2 for the OECD countries is negative, so there's, there's a lot of, of embodied uh, uh, CO2 in our uh, consumption patterns. That is interesting from a policy perspective because it tells you that the policy action is not only something that happens at the supply side, but also needs to take into account uh, consumption uh, patterns and international trade. Here's another example that resides more in the area of uh, uh, interaction between economic policy and uh, environment. Uh, what you have here is a picture from a study that concerns Mexico, where the uh, petrol subsidies that are handed out in the country have been traced back to the ultimate recipients, and these recipients have been broken down by uh, their income uh, uh, level. So you have the decile, the lowest 10% to the highest 10% of income. And it is interesting to note that uh, the highest uh, income group also benefits most from the petrol subsidies. So this is a typical case where policy is called to uh, think this uh, through because not only do you may you be subsidizing CO2, also the subsidies in a way go to the have a regressive effect and maybe going to the wrong part of the uh, population. Um, now let me come to the third level, which is really about sustainability. Okay? But all I've been talking so far were really uh, contemporaneous effects, uh, uh, if you want. Uh, uh, but now let's kind of look uh, at things over time. The theory is actually pretty simple if you want to measure uh, whether our behavior right now is... Uh, uh, sustainable or not, uh, basically uh, we need to look at stocks. That's what I said before. And if the idea is that one way or the other we'd like to preserve stocks uh, over time, it would mean that uh, we should have a net investment for different types of stocks that we want to bring over to next generations that is positive. Now what kind of stocks are we looking at? Well, we're looking at produced capital, uh, that is machinery, equipment. We're looking at natural capital, of course. We're looking at human capital, social capital, and there's a kind of a productivity component in there. I don't need to uh, get into that now. Uh, so we could say that if we want to have some sort of indications whether uh, we are on a sustainable path, we only need to observe whether these net investments are positive. Uh, and indeed, this is the gist, I think, of the genuine savings approach that uh, the World Bank has been pursuing for uh, a number of years now. And I still think this is an extremely useful approach, but of course it is, uh, uh, there are a lot of ifs and buts in terms of measurement that come in uh, when we like to, when we want to follow this approach. And uh, <coughs> what are these ifs and buts? Uh, uh, or what are these measurement issues? I say the valuation of peace, that is, uh, how do we value these stocks? I mean, it's typically, uh, we can uh, observe the physical stock uh, in many cases, not always, but then we want to put some kind of valuation uh, to it. And uh, we actually need a lot of information uh, to do this. Ideally, uh, we would value these stocks with a measure, monetary or other, that really reflects social preferences, uh, not only today, but also uh, of the future. And that is, of course, uh, hard to do because somehow we have to think of what this future path could look like that we want to uh, measure uh, uh, today. Is it business as usual? Does it include adjustment strategies? All this would influence <laughs> kind of the, the current price of a stock from a social uh, perspective. Doesn't mean that uh, the criterion of looking at this overall net investment is not useful, but it has to be interpreted with a certain uh, caution, best in the sense that if it's strongly negative, it's probably a sign that there is uh, 
some sort of non-sustainability in current uh, behavior. And uh, even if there are some issues about the exact interpretation of this change in overall net investment, it is still true that the measurement of the stocks individually looked at is of significant interest if you want to make statements about sustainability in economic, social, or environmental uh, fields. Now, when I put myself into the shoes of a uh, statistical office, uh, uh, there is often a question, uh, where are the limits of monetization, where are the limits uh, of uh, measurability of some of these assets? And I'd just like to throw out three criteria here that typically will come through in the discussions uh, of the, the measurement. The first uh, criterion is, and I'll, I'll do this in the context of natural assets, just to make things simple, but one could have similar criterion for human capital uh, and for social capital and economic assets. So the first criterion is uh, the natural asset that we're looking in, is it actually something that is in principle covered by the national accounts? Uh, this kind of uh, accounting framework that every uh, country uses uh, to set up a balance sheet. Uh, and indeed, uh, there are quite a few of the natural assets that would be of interest that are part of our national balance sheets, even in the national accounts. Example, uh, land, Subsoil resources, some biological uh, resources like uh, orchards and uh, fish from aquaculture, and some uh, uh, other non-produced assets like natural uh, timber and uh, uh, fish in, in domestic uh, water. So even if you stick within the rather constrained framework of national accounts, there's already uh, a number of assets, natural assets, that need to be measured. And if you look at the national accounts of OECD countries, there, there's a lot of gaps there. And actually, it's very hard to get this information. So a first kind of immediate and important step would be to uh, uh, get those measures right and to have good measures of land, say, for the, for the OECD countries to start with. A second and very important criterion that comes back in this discussion is, well, suppose we measure the stock of land or the timber that uh, stands uh, somewhere. What is the price that we want to put to it? Should it be a private valuation that is a sort of market price? Or uh, should it be a social valuation that reflects also the positive or negative externalities that come along with the existence and exploitation of that uh, resource? Uh, obviously, private values are somewhat easier to get at because in some areas we do have markets that provide uh, some indication of uh, where the valuation uh, should come in. And indeed, in the national accounts balance sheets, we want the market uh, valuation. But of course, uh, when we use a market valuation, the externalities are, are ignored. And that is a problem if we want to track sustainability, because we may under or over value this net investment of the resource that, uh, that we, are, we are looking at. Typically, social valuations uh, uh, require uh, some sort of modeling uh, and assessment that typically goes beyond uh, the comfort zone of statistical offices, but not beyond the comfort zone of research uh, work. Uh, and it should be said that the social valuations, at least in principles, are, are the right valuations for uh, tracking sustainability. Uh, the third criterion in deciding how far to go in this measurement of, of asset is are we talking about individual or combined assets? Uh, that is important in the context of natural assets. It is obviously easier to measure individual natural assets, like you know, valuation of timber, the valuation of the oil in the ground, or the uh, fresh water that is around. But of course, from an environmental perspective, uh, you'd be much more interested in ecosystems, which is the dynamic interaction of all these assets as they are out there and uh, uh, form our natural environment. So it is conceptually very important to recognize these uh, ecosystem assets and uh, uh, services, but of course at the same time, it is very hard to uh, measure them uh, 
physical in physical terms, but uh, also and, and even more so in in monetary terms. Again, there is a lot of work ongoing at the at the World Bank, and uh, maybe Mayan will will say something about this uh, too. But again, it is an area where the statistical offices would probably be very cautious about moving into a valuation here. Um, let me finish this uh, uh, issue of natural resources with a little example from Australia where uh, we tried to construct an index of uh, natural resources, which is simply a weighted average of the physical net changes in stocks of various assets that you find in, in Australia. Uh, these are aggregated with uh, the weights that correspond to the share of each stock in the overall market valuation. So it's a, it's a, it's a private uh, valuation here. Uh, and uh, these are uh, data that are being published by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Now, these are subsoil assets, so we're talking about uh, exhaustible resources. And uh, it is interesting to observe that this index goes up all the time. Uh, so it's a change in the net stock. What is the change in the net stock? Is basically the difference between <coughs> extractions and additions to the stock. Additions are discoveries. Well, uh, discoveries are not a physically, uh, a physically phenomenon only. They are to a large deal an economic phenomenon. And assets become, discoveries become, well, discoveries in the first place because it's economically interesting to uh, explore uh, new resources and they become economically viable because market prices for subsoil assets go up. So suddenly in Australia, if you construct this asset, you have uh, a picture whereby uh, the supposedly non-renewable resources of subsoil assets actually increases all the time. It's basically an economic a phenomenon that leads to a more of an addition to the asset than a removal from it. This is, it's not a price effect directly. So you see this is a volume index that you have before you, but it's this strong increase of uh, discoveries that are economically viable, which shape that, uh, that curve. And you can imagine this immediately is an interesting observation that gives rise to discussions, both about the index, but also about what it means for, for policy. Uh, you can track down this index and then say which are the assets that have most contributed to its uh, change. And well, I mean, these are copper, natural gas, iron ore, the typical things that have uh, expanded in the Australian economy. And you will find similar pictures for, us, for Canada where we did uh, an index of the same kind and for Norway and so on. So, those are the type of things that uh, we're trying to develop and uh, to put before policymakers for uh, discussion and uh, appreciation. Now, let me summarize what I've been uh, trying to convey here. Uh, we are approaching the measurement of current well being, structural relations in the economy and sustainability somewhat separately, not because they don't belong together, but because we think doing it all at once at the same time is just too hard to do, and it's, uh, it's better to separate this out. We don't have an aggregate index of current well-being, but uh, we have some more limited aggregation that I uh, showed before, and of course you have the personal beta life index that everyone can use. We also don't have an aggregate index of green growth, but we have a set of indicators out of which we have selected six headline indicators. I don't have time to explain uh, what they are. Uh, maybe I should just mention that it was a very interesting process in terms of the political economy of dealing with countries to actually get agreement on the six headline indicators out of the uh, 30s. Um, so, by the same reason, for the same reason, we don't have an aggregate index for sustainability, uh, but uh, we uh, place a lot of emphasis on the measurement of the different types of stocks, and I gave you a few examples. I should add that we also uh, have an, an important activity on, uh, on human capital, 
and on a natural capital. And both of these are actually done jointly with uh, the World Bank. Overall, I'd probably characterize the OECD's approach as a rather a pragmatic uh, one because we very much uh, care about making things digestible for our policymakers as well. Which uh, brings me to my last uh, slide. Uh, the indicators that we've been producing, of course, are uh, of some interest, but they don't tell you which policies to adapt. And so they have to be put into an, uh, uh, an analytical uh, context. And uh, we are trying to feed them into the OECD policy work that is not necessarily done by my department, but in other parts of the OECD. That's what I relate here to in terms of uh, mainstreaming this work uh, in the OECD country studies and other economic analyses that are being that are being carried out. And on that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, you're right when you say that um, aggregation is not is not easy. Uh, sometimes it is costly. Uh, we have been using a quite sophisticated approach based on Shoke integrals. Uh, uh, to assess how much an indicator is overlapping with another one, because there is also an issue of contents, indicators sometimes overlapping, or the other way around, they, they, make comp they can be complement rather than, than, than uh, substitute. So, uh, we have a, a method, a mathematical method, to, uh, to quantify this uh, um, degree of overlapping of different indicators, and then we build the weights and the aggregation method upon, uh, upon this, but uh, we need experts' uh, judgment. And in the, in the case of a research institute, we can gather some experts and ask them what they think and, uh, and then uh, compute the, the weights. In the case of uh, the OECD, it's much more complicated to ask governments their, their own assessment on, uh, on this kind of uh, different dimensions of uh, sustainability and then, and then apply the methodology. Anyway, uh, questions, comments, remarks? Uh, it was quite an interesting lecture, so uh, if there are, please. Uh, concerning the, the stocks and the system of national accounts, uh, this is exactly the same thing. So when I talk about the system of national accounts, I mean the 2008 SNA with its uh, balance sheets as they are defined. So there, there's, uh, this is our work. Now, what I didn't mention and what I should have mentioned in this context is that uh, the OECD and indeed a lot of other international, uh, the international statistical community has also adopted another new international standard, the so-called System of Integrated Environmental and Economic Accounts, the SEA, which goes beyond the asset boundaries of the system of national accounts and uh, would include uh, you know, assets that are not, that I, I didn't mention and which are environmentally important. But, uh, uh, and that new standard was only uh, adopted a year ago by the United Nations Statistical Commission. Uh, the uh, novelty is that this new standard is compatible with the national accounts in the sense that the classifications match and you will actually be able to link the economic information from the national accounts to the more environmentally uh, targeted information from the SEA in the future. And there's a lot of activity on this, on this end as well. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, the information that is generated will be compatible, which it hadn't been in the past. Uh, concerning the second question about inclusion, um, <coughs> I, I very briefly mentioned some work uh, that runs under the uh, label inclusive growth that we are we're conducting as well. Basically, what we're doing there is we're zooming in on three specific dimensions of current well-being. Uh, those are household income, uh, jobs in, this, in the form of a risk of unemployment, 
and health uh, in, the, in the form of uh, life expectancy. And here, for each of these dimensions, uh, we construct an aggregate, we, we, we const for all three dimensions, we construct an aggregate index that would provide to get, uh, bring together those three dimensions plus how they are distributed across households. And uh, uh, so there the inclusiveness comes uh, through in the sense not only of income distribution and how it evolves, but also distribution of health and distribution of uh, the risk of, of unemployment. But uh, again, it is an approach that would look at this contemporaneous inclusiveness uh, in a separately. And I mean, we, we can't link it with the sustainability question in one go, so to say. Other questions, uh, Max? I'm wondering, going back to your, to your clearly a tension here between developing a set of indicators which span all the range of issues that you highlighted on one end, and the tension against providing an aggregate indicator weighting these different components in such a way because politically it's difficult, it requires a lot of uh, effort, as you said. On the other hand, obviously, to what extent can we use this set of indicators which are so diverse and so numerous to provide policy implication? That's in your last slide, indeed, you were pointing to the fact that it's difficult to prescribe policies or to be policy relevant with, with such tools. Uh, can we go the other way around? Think about existing policies or future policies and look at the impacts on all these indicators and then let the user decide on which ones, depending on which ones he feels that are mostly relevant. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your OECD Better Life Index now. And indeed, you have here the ability to create your better life index, right? You leave the user the possibility to weight differently these different components just because it's very subjective. But how can you make the link to policies uh, otherwise? So. The, the link to policies uh, is indeed uh, is not an easy task, but uh, we, have, uh, we have started to make some, some headway there. The, the key issue is to understand that uh, uh, when, we are con when we're conceiving policies or when policymakers are conceiving policies, uh, that uh, there is an inherent element of multidimensionality that comes through with this approach. Now, one can argue about the individual dimensions and so on, but the, the key idea is that uh, policies need to address more than one objective. And in the past, or so far, the overwhelming objective has been uh, GDP growth. And uh, so if there's one message that we are trying to uh, get across with this work um, uh, on well-being is that that may not always be the, the best substitute for the 11 dimensions. So, so this kind of multi-dimensionality, how it, how it affects, how individual policies be it growth policies, education policies, innovation policies, how they affect not only the, s the specific objective that they were designed for, but various kind of multiple ob objectives, that is, uh, uh, that is the basic message. That is not easy to do, but we've started to integrate this approach into some of the OECD economic uh, surveys of countries. And uh, uh, so we've done it for Austria, we're, we're doing it for, for Israel, uh, even for the US, there's, a, there's talk about bringing it in. And it's more a, a way of, of alerting to this multidimensionality multi and measuring it than uh, you know, having exact, say, econometric relationships between different types of policies and the multidimensionality. We're also doing some work along this area, but that's more research uh, related, I think. I, can I, uh, Please. just to give you an example, because it becomes clearer. The Austrian survey uh, was, uh, uh, was presented a few months ago, and uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why Austria has actually been doing very well through the crisis and, and otherwise has been this kind of social consensus that exists in Austria. I mean, there are a few strikes, and there's a lot of negotiations between social partners, and this social partnership that... Uh, seem to play an important role uh, in the economic outcomes for households in, in Austria in terms of youth, unemployment, and so on. And uh, in, in the previous discussions, including by the OECD when we surveyed Austria, this was kind of, you know, 
it was an afterthought or a, a side aspect uh, that wasn't really central. The, the issue was, you know, the, the macroeconomic policy towards uh, uh, GDP. Well, uh, it basically, the weights were somewhat readjusted in this survey, and things like this came through more, more strongly and, and helped explaining things that otherwise could have gone unnoticed. Some more questions? No? Okay, thank you. And next speaker is, thank you, Paul. Uh, next speaker is going to be Marianne Fay. Uh, she's the chief economist of the Sustainable Development Network of the World Bank, and she's probably the most appropriate person to talk about these issues. She has a wide experience and she's coordinating a lot of uh, research activities on, uh, on green growth and, in particular, measurement indicators. So uh, her lecture will be particularly important for all researchers here who are working in, uh, in this area. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, before I start on my talk, I was, uh, Paul's presentation uh, triggered one thought, which is I noticed that Switzerland was the clear winner in your Better Life Index. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the famous Orson Welles quote in The Third Man, where he talks about how in Italy you had 30 years of, under the Borgias, there was 30 years of warfare, terror, murder, bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. And then in Switzerland, they had brotherly love, they had 500 year of peace and democracy. And what did they produce? The cuckoo clock. So <laughs> <laughs> just some food for thought there as we're ranking countries. <clears throat> so um, what, I'd like, what I'm going to present today is, uh, in fact, two reports, but I couldn't get the Wi-Fi to work in my hotel room. So you only have one picture of our uh, inclusive green growth report. And the other uh, document that I uh, report that I will talk about is, in fact, a series of, of uh, publications. Uh, we're about to produce a third one on the wealth of nation. And, and uh, Paul has mentioned some of this work. And this is something on which we're now <laughs> we're, uh, collaborating very much with the OECD. So the, the starting point, really, of all this, this work on green growth is that sustainable development absolutely requires growth. Um, if we think about the three pillars of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental, there's been a real culture change in the perception of the complementarity between the social and the economic pillar. When I started, and it wasn't always so, when I started in the development business, when I started at the World Bank more than 20 years ago, you had people in one corner who worked on growth. They were the serious people. They were the people who, you know, really mattered, and they did a lot of, you know, they looked at the macro stuff. And then you had a few people in a sort of in a corridor somewhere who worked on social issues. And, you know, the idea was very much you grew first. I mean, you know, this was the 90s, the Reagan era. You grew first, and then you worried about the social issues, and there was trickle down and all these ideas. And then in the course of the 90s, there was this real culture shift where suddenly, where eventually, you know, it, was, it became much more accepted, much better understood that, in fact, economic and social objectives are very much complementary. We now know, and repeated research is showing, that growth is very much good for the poor, but also that, you know, improving your social outcomes is good for growth. So this kind of culture shift is very much what we want to try to accomplish in the link between the environmental and the, and the growth uh, ec economic pillars. And that's the whole idea uh, of, of this green growth that both the OECD and ourselves and UNEP and a number of other institutions have been working on. So now when I've presented this rep report in Europe, I often get pushed back on this insistence on growth. Now that doesn't happen in developing countries at all, but it does happen in Europe. And the reason why this never happens in developing countries is that it's really hard to imagine redistributing the pie in developing countries in a way that would be sufficient to make everybody really reasonably well off. Income per capita in developing countries is still around about $2,300 per capita. Uh, you know, the literature on, on, on happiness suggests that, you know, income increases still matter at that level of, of income, that you really do increase it. The second reason why growth is important is because repeated research, as I just mentioned, has shown that we really eliminate poverty mostly through growth. 
intuitively it's fairly simple. It's just a lot easier to grow the pie than to sh change the way that we distribute it. And you can see from this graph that, you know, thanks to growth, poverty rates in the world in developing countries has fallen, have fallen from about 43% all the way down to about 10, 11%. Now, even with that, we still expect close to 1 billion people to continue living in poverty by 2050. So more growth, better growth, of course, but more growth is needed. Now, the problem is, of course, that, as you well know, this growth has come at the expense of the environment for the last 250 years. Most of you have probably already seen this graph. Uh, it's now getting a little dated, but I still think it's the best visual and quick way of looking at where we are in terms of our uh, environmental outcomes. This is work that was done by Rockstrom and another, I think, close to 20 scientists. They look at about 10 different planetary systems and they tried to estimate what are the safe boundaries for these planetary systems. And these are the green circles that you see in the middle. For two of them, they couldn't figure out exactly what these boundaries were, uh, but for the other eight, they could. And then they looked at where we were relative to these boundaries. And for a number of them, we are way beyond the boundary. For several others, we're dangerously close to the boundary. So the verdict is clear that continued growth uh, in the, the form that we've been having in previous de decades or even century is simply not possible, particularly as we're heading to a global population of 9 billion people. The development model that we had at, you know, in the 1850s when we had uh, approximately 1.5 billion people in the planet is clearly no longer adapted. So just a few notes on the definition of green growth. So the OECD has some very elegant definitions. We do too, UNEP has, we all have very nice, sophisticated definitions. But what, what it all boils down to is a very simple concept, which is we're just talking about economic growth that's environmentally sustainable, no more, no less. Um, we've often, we've had a lot of pushback uh, from a number of, of, of people saying, look, we just got used to sustainable development, and now you're coming up with this new paradigm. And there, we really want to insist on the fact that, as I mentioned before, Green growth is not a paradigm shift. It's not even a paradigm. It's just a way of trying to achieve the sustainable development that we really need. And then there was this question about inclusive green growth and how do you link the inclusive and the green. And there, I think, I really want to insist upon the fact that green growth per se is not necessarily inclusive. You can think about different ways that you can design environmental policies to make them inclusive, but they're not inherently inclusive. And if they're not done very carefully, they could actually very much harm the poor. So the reason why we called our report Inclusive Green Growth was not in fact because we do a lot on the inclusive part, but as a clear reminder that we do need to pursue inclusive green growth and it's not a people versus planet uh, policy choice. So the big question um, that I think we need to ask ourselves is whether this greening growth is possible. Can we really green growth without necessarily slowing it? And I was beginning a conversation with Carlo earlier that when I looked at your sustainability index, uh, when you, you look at the handout that was distributed, the, the scenario that has a fairly ambitious environmental policy is one where the growth costs are very high. Now, of course, probably what's behind it, and I'm sure we will discuss it this afternoon, is whether we're just capturing the cost of actions and not weighing in the cost of inaction. But still, there is, you know, there is a fundamental question of to what extent are there arbitrage between these issues. So the way we, we thought about it was that um, there's at least three ways that we can probably, we can certainly green our growth without necessarily slowing it. We don't know whether it will take us all the way there, but it will certainly take us a part of the way. The first one has to do with the tremendous inefficiencies that are characterizing our, our, our economic systems today. So just a simple picture, this is by no means, by no stretch of the imagination, an efficient transportation system. I think you would all agree. Now, you know, of course, if we had electric cars and these electric cars were fueled with uh, clean electricity, well, maybe this wouldn't necessarily be that unsustainable. The problem is that this particular mode of transportation is associated with a particular lifestyle which looks like this. 
Uh, and this particular lifestyle is extremely hungry in both water and land, which are two things that we don't have that much of. And by the way, um, a question to all of you, where do you think that lower last picture is taken? The top one is Los Angeles. But what about this second one? Anybody wants to venture a guess? Sorry? China. It is China. So it is not Los Angeles. It is China. And, and one of the issue there, with the first time I presented this at the World Bank, one of our uh, Chinese colleague or a member of the board told me that I shouldn't be picking on China and so on and so forth. And, and I really want to make sure that the message here is clear. The message is not that China doesn't, you know, shouldn't be doing this. The message is that today, people's standard of success is to have the big SUV parked in front of a Mac mansion somewhere in the suburbs. Now, perhaps this is less so in Italy, but in the vast majority of the emerging world, the standards of success are the ones that are depicted in soap operas uh, produced in uh, California. And as long as the standard of success is the SUV parked in front of the Mac mansion, it's going to be very difficult to achieve the kind of green growth that we want. Because if we have billions of people around the planet who think that this is necessary for their self-esteem, uh, rather than you know a sort of a, a small apartment in the center of the city and a fancy Danish bicycle, uh, we are going to have difficulties achieving this, this green growth. Now, Another way in which there are tremendous inefficiencies are in the management of natural resources and in the pricing of, of, of uh, services. So for example, this is India, but I could have taken a similar picture from Mexico. These are two countries that spend one to 2% of GDP every year in subsidizing the electricity that's used to pump water out of the ground for irrigation. Uh, these are two countries that in fact have tremendous problems with water scarcity and whose agriculture is not that productive. So these subsidies are very much harming the environment but not achieving very much either in terms of distribution and there, this is similar to uh, Paul's point about the uh, energy subsidies. These are not very well targeted. And I will not comment on this last one but the, the main point is there are plenty of inefficiencies in our systems and exploiting them can certainly help us green growth without necessarily slowing it. Now, a second, uh, since I have a whole bunch of economists there, I had to have at least one little equation. So a second thing to think about is thinking just about the economy in terms of the usual production function, where output is a function of, of uh, innovation as well, or not a social, uh, innovation, uh, capital, and labor. And what is missing in the way that we usually depict our production function? Now, of course, it's the uh, natural capital. And if we start talking, and one of the things we've been trying to get is to have our colleagues at the World Bank no longer talk about the environment, but talk about natural capital. Because the minute we talk about capital, well, capital is something you invest in, something that you have to manage carefully so that you get high returns. And so, um, if we think about managing the environment as natural capital, then we can definitely think about uh, trying to manage it more carefully. And here I'd like to give you one example of how managing the environment as natural capital more carefully can actually have extremely positive impacts on growth. This is the Los Plateau, an area in China about the size of France. Um, which has been overgrazed and mismanaged from an environmental point of view for centuries. And in the early 90s, this is what the Los Plateau looked like. Um, and Los is this very fine uh, soil that whenever there's windstorms just blows away. And so not only were people living in this area extremely poor, suffering from many <clears throat> accidents of landslides and erosion and things like that, but also the cities downwind, hundreds of kilometers downwinds had tremendous problem of air pollution, asthma and all, all these other things. So a colleague of ours at the World Bank, uh, along with the Chinese government, developed this massive uh, reforestation and watershed restoration program. Uh, a big part of this was to remove an incentive, a, a, a social policy that the Chinese had, which was to distribute goats to very poor people. Now goats tend to uh, turn almost any landscapes into this kind of thing. Um, and after about 10 years, this is what the Los Plateau looks like today. Now, obviously, it looks much nicer. It's much prettier. We would all much rather go spend a vacation or live in a place like this. But what also happened during that time is that the income of the local populations doubled. Now, many other things were happening in China at the time. We don't have a 
a, a, a very clean impact evaluation of this. But clearly, people are able to have much better uh, incomes as well as have, suffer much less from all the uh, other environmental disasters that I mentioned. So um, the point here is really clearly investing in natural capital can be the smart economic thing to do. The third point is that um, you know, very often we hear, well, let's grow now and we'll worry about cleaning up later. But cleaning up later is not always possible. And one of the ways of reducing the cost of greening growth is acting when the opportunities arise. And therefore, developing countries, one of the big issues is urbanization. Cities in developing countries are growing very, very fast. And the decisions that are made today about the shape of, of the cities, decisions about public transport, about uh, land use planning, and so on and so forth, are decisions that will have, to a large extent, an irreversible impact and impact centuries into the future. So just to look at the consequences of some of these decisions, I'm comparing here Atlanta and Barcelona. Um, they, when this uh, mapping was done, they had approximately the same population. But Atlanta had uh, covered about 4,300 square kilometers and Barcelona about 102. Now, let me do a little pop quiz to see whether you're paying attention. In which of these cities do you think the city planners are having a really hard time designing a, uh, a self-financing uh, public transportation uh, system? Well, I'll give you a hint, it's not Barcelona, <laughs> okay? So, and, and the problem is, of course, the Atlanta city planners are struggling today with decisions, with the consequences of decisions that were made, uh, you know, some 50 or 60 or 100 years ago. So I will stop now my uh, convincing you that we, you know, clearly we have to go with green growth, which I'm sure everybody is already convinced of, uh, and also of this idea that we can certainly do a lot better without necessarily slowing growth. But then move now to this idea of how do we measure progress? How do we manage to uh, show this progress? And one of the reasons we need to show this progress is to convince others to do, this, to do this, it's really important to be able to show countries that have managed to do it. And one of the big problems we've been having with you know, this whole debate about green growth is, of course, we have no example. No country existing today developed in a clean way. You take Italy, you take France, you take Germany, you take the United States. We all grew dirty and then cleaned up later. So it's very difficult to find good examples. And that's why we also want to have indicators that can help us show progress even in incremental ways, <clears throat> in ways that are not immediately dramatic because that will not show up for a long time. So what are some of the key challenges that we're, we're facing? And by the way, I should mention that this is very much work in progress. I mean, as, as uh, Paul was mentioning, and I think I'm sure Carlo will mention this afternoon, all of us are, are trying to think collectively on how to do this. And I'd, all of us have some part of the puzzle, but I think none of us, or certainly we don't at the World Bank, have the full picture. So, but I would really wanted to highlight some of the key challenges that we're encountering with this work on measuring progress. And the first one is, is a cultural one, which is moving beyond the GDP. Any economist with his or her salt can expound for hours about how ridiculous of an indicator GDP is, right? We all heard the, this, you know, what happens if I stop cleaning my house and I and hire somebody to do it, well, I've increased GDP. I mean, it is a very absurd indicator by, by many ways, yet it is an indicator that everybody uses. It is the indicator that the press reports on. It is the indicator that my mother, your mother, your aunt, your grandmother understand when they see it reported in the newspaper, and that's very valuable. But if you think about it, no firm, no company would go to the market with only an income account. They always go to the market for their valuation with both an income account and an asset account. Yet we as countries only talk about our income statement. We say nothing about our asset statement. And this is what Paul was talking about. We really need to be able to have a measure of wealth to see whether the income flow that is you know, captured by GDP is in fact sustainable or we're living off of our assets and our inheritance. The second major challenge is a theoretical one, which is how do you capture sustainability in a single indicator? And that's an extremely difficult thing to do. We discussed it, uh, Paul discussed it, we will discuss it more this afternoon, so I won't say more about this. Then there is the policy challenge, which is how do you design indicators that are useful? Now, 
a single indicator is important because a single indicator captures the imagination. That's how we could get into the press. And just to give you an anecdote about the importance of that single indicator, when a couple of months ago the World Bank was, was designing its new policy and you know, the idea, the debate internally was we needed to, to have something on poverty, we needed to have something on shared prosperity and inclusion, but we also needed something on sustainability. Now if you go to the World Bank website today and you look at mission statement, you will find that it talks about shared prosperity and poverty alleviation or elimination. There's no longer much of a mention of sustainability. It just says that it'll be done in a sustainable manner. But there isn't an indicator <clears throat> on poverty. We have one, we have a target. On shared prosperity, we have a target. But <clears throat> my colleagues and myself were not, who cared deeply about sustainability, we lost the battle because we couldn't come up with a single indicator. We worked really hard, we came up with four. We, we tried to push to have four, just four. We couldn't get to a single number. And we couldn't get to a number that, or, or an indicator that sufficiently captured the, uh, the imagination of our colleagues that it could be there. Now, of course, our big worry is if that indicator is not there, things that are not measured are not valued, and therefore sustainability will not be valued in the same way as objectives of poverty or shared prosperity. Now, this said, a single indicator, <clears throat> and I think this is where I would disagree with, the, the, with you here with when, when the implicit assumption that I understood behind your question. From a policy point of view, a single indicator is not actually, I would argue, very useful. From a policy point of view, the synthetic indicator is too minimalistic. You can't really then build the policy around it, and that's why I think it's really important to have, even if you have a synthetic indicator, that can capture the imagination and at least give you a sense of whether you're going in the right or the wrong direction, you really need to be able to break down that indicator, I think, in the way that you guys have tried to do, so that it can be useful for policy purposes. And then, of course, there's a practical challenge, which is the data on sustainability, particularly on natural assets, is very limited, and that's particularly true in developing countries. It's a challenge in high-income countries or OECD countries, but it's an even greater challenge in the developing countries that are the, 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 our clients. So this said, let me sort of give you a sense of some of the measures that we're playing with or some of the issues, the, the, the thinking that we have, which is very much complementary to what others are doing. So starting from economic growth as measured by GDP, we have objectives of poverty eradication, shared prosperity, and we've come to an agreement at the World Bank on these two particular indicators, the number of people b below the international poverty line, which is $1.25 a day, and for shared prosperity, the income growth of the bottom 40%. Neither of these are perfect, of course, as indicators, but they are what they are, and these we can measure fairly easily, although the income growth of the bottom 40% is still a little difficult to calculate. Now, as mentioned before, we want to include in here a change in wealth to ensure that this flow of income is not generated at the expense of, uh, of our assets. Now, in terms of the assets, we have this, this genuine saving measure and this measure of wealth per capita. And this is work uh, done by Kirk Hamilton and Glenn Marie Lang at the World Bank and with this, new public, uh, this publication series that they have. And the, the framework there is financial capital, physical capital, human capital, and natural capital. We don't actually capture social capital, which is something that is still missing. Now, this wealth measure is extremely useful and valuable, and, and we've got data going back to the early 90s for about, I think, 140 countries. So it's a fairly comprehensive measure. It has a number of limitations, though. So from that point of view, it should be thought of as work in progress. One is our measure of uh, human capital is simply uh, the flow of education expenditures. And that obviously does not capture the full set. It also, as I said, doesn't capture social capital. Then a second problem with this measure is that it assumes perfect substitutability between these different types of capital, which is obviously not something that we can, we believe in. So, and that's why, one of the reasons why I was, when I was trying to come up with indicators of sustainability, I was coming up with four because we felt we really had to complement this with measures of uh, the health of water, land, and air pollution. Um, because otherwise we, we, we are not capturing the, the basic um, 
<clears throat> the basic uh, uh, bottom line. And then the third thing is something that uh, Paul talked about, is the fact that for some of those assets within natural capital, it's extremely difficult to assign a monetary value. And this wealth measure is using monetary values as a way of aggregating these different uh, factors. So just to show you how we calculate the change in wealth per capita, we start with gross savings uh, from which we deduct the depreciation of fixed capital. Um, that gives us the net savings to which we add, in order to capture human capital, the flow of educational expenditures and uh, we deduct the depletion of natural resources. Now, we also have to uh, take into account the fact that population growth has a wealth-reducing effect, right, in terms of wealth per capita. So we uh, do a population growth adjustment so that we can look at the wealth uh, per capita. <clears throat> and this is just looking at how uh, population-adjusted uh, changes in wealth per capita relates to income uh, per capita. And there isn't a clear relationship. So some of the, in, the wealthier countries are actually increasing their wealth, while others are, are not. Um, a couple of other factors that we thought needed to be uh, brought in in ter terms of uh, capturing sustainability is resource efficiency. Uh, and there, there's different ways of measuring it. Uh, energy intensity, water productivity, and then we, we find the, the green multi-factor productivity work that the OEC is doing to be an extremely interesting way of looking at this as well. Now, another set of issues that is increasingly of concern, particularly in developing countries, is resilience, and particularly resilience to natural hazard. I mean, this you've probably all seen the front pages of the newspapers this morning with the pictures from the Philippines, which really drive this point home of this idea that you know, unless we can develop, improve our management of risk and the resilience to, uh, to these, uh, to these uh, natural shock, that will greatly compromise uh, development prospect, particularly sustainable development prospect. We're already seeing in many developing countries that development budgets, so resources that were available to build new roads or build greener infrastructure and greener energy, are being diverted away from new investment towards uh, repairing what has been destroyed by natural destructions. Um, and then a key thing that we also need a lot of work on, and by the way, the yellow are the two areas where we simply just don't have the data yet. Um, the second, so the other thing on which we really still need to do a lot of work is this whole issue of, of the green policies. And uh, the OECD has been doing a lot of work on collecting data on environmental regulation, environmental taxes and spending, uh, and so, so on and so forth. But that data is simply not available in developing countries, and this is something that we're trying to develop or find good proxies for. Um, and the problem, of course, is just having an environmental policy on the book is no guarantee that it is being applied. Uh, so what we'd like to be able to capture is environmental stringencies and in the stringency of environmental policies, whether they're being enforced or not. And let me end here. So this is uh, the report and uh, just one small plug uh, for this work on the wealth of nation, which you can find on our website. And also, just to mention that uh, the World Bank, with a number of other institutions, is involved in something called the WAVES Partnership, which is wealth accounting, stands for Wealth Accounting and Valuation of Ecosystem Services, where we're working to do several things. One is to develop methodology to value ecosystems so that they can be brought into the system of environmental and economic accountings. We're also working with a number of developing countries or any developing countries interested to develop uh, systems of natural accounts. And uh, that could be done in a comprehensive way or sometimes countries are interested in developing accounting for a particular resource. So Botswana was interested in water accounting, for example, because it's a scarce resource. And the use of that resource will determine the, the kind of economic strategies available to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. We have time, five, ten minutes for questions uh, and comments. Are there any? Please. 
Hi, uh, my name is Enrica. I'm a researcher at FIM. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. And uh, I didn't hear you speaking a lot about the role of institution in um, determining and affecting economic growth. And um, so I was wondering whether this is a decision you made because the data that are available on institutional quality are not good enough for doing developing some indicators about this uh, dimension. Thank you. Um, there, there is some work that has been done on the role of institutions on uh, environmental policies. And <clears throat> we should, in fact, include it in the sort of enabling uh, conditions. The, I'm not sure, though, that it's a fully developed topic, and I think the research is really only in the beginning. It seems that issues like democracy in some help, or rather, democracy, for example, helps some aspect of environmental policies, but not others. So if you compare the U.S. and China, for example, it's quite telling that, yes, there are some, uh, some aspects of environmental policies that are much better, but the day that China decided to start improving uh, carbon emission, then it can move forward in a particular direction, whereas the U.S. is completely paralyzed. So there are pros and cons. Uh, what we do find, though, is having a vocal press, having freedom of press, having uh, a culture of, activist, of activism uh, help reduce a number of things, particularly those more insidious uh, environmental issues such as water pollution and so on and so forth. So it's probably much more useful for uh, environmental problems that are local and uh, more immediate, uh, but it has much less of an impact on global public goods and on uh, things that are perhaps a lot less visible and don't capture the public's imagination. Other questions? Go ahead. Question about green innovation. Uh, you didn't talk too much about it. What, what kind of role? Sorry. What kind of role does it that great does green innovation plays in this agenda? Especially to what extent it can clash or not with an agenda which is as inclusive as the first objective. Sometimes innovation is certainly an, an engine of growth. To what extent it also provides inclusiveness is not obvious. Uh, so I was wondering about your opinion on this topic. Well, the vast majority of innovation doesn't happen in developing countries, right? Most of it happened in high-income countries. And uh, one of the things that's really critical, of course, is to, I mean, it's very difficult to imagine that you could have green growth without having much slower growth unless there's substantial innovation. But what we're finding is not only is the supply of innovation mostly happening in high-income country, we need the demand for innovation to come from high-income countries because with that demand, uh, and particularly if things are brought to scale, the cost of these new green products or these green innovations can come down dramatically and become affordable for developing countries. So for example, if you think about <coughs> Germany's uh, solar policy, um, has been criticized in, for, for many reasons, including a uh, big debate about the fact that maybe all the jobs ended up going to China, etc., uh, which is anyway debatable. But one of the things that Germany's solar policy did was to massively help massively increase demand and therefore bring the cost of solar down in a substantial way. And you could argue that what Germany did for global development through its solar policy is probably much more important than anything that it ever did through direct development assistance. So, yes, I agree with you that innovation per se can be a misery, well, can, can have different impacts on job creation and so on and so forth. But to the extent that innovation is allowed to flow, uh, innovation, I think, is going to be extremely helpful. And what developing countries tend to need to focus on is domestic adaptation and absorption capacity. Mm, there was another question before, down there. Well, thanks for your presentation, definitely interesting. Um, 
I think that green growth at, has a lot to do with the um, resource efficiency. You also mentioned it uh, at the end uh, of the presentation. And I was wondering to what extent the, the issue of um, the rebound effects is dealt with in this uh, conceptual framework. Thank you. Um, in the report, I didn't go into all the details of the report because I wanted to have time to discuss uh, the measurement issues. But in the report, we discussed quite a lot about this. So in, in particular, we, you know, economists tend to think that if, as long as you get the prices right, then resource efficiency will follow. And what we find over and over is that that's not true. Um, you know, energy efficiency is one of the biggest puzzles, right? That yes, energy efficiency tends to go up when the price of energy goes up, but there's it's still plenty of existing innovations that are not being utilized and so on and so forth. So one of the things we talk about in the report is the extent to which you can use multiple tools to try to achieve the resource efficiency that you need. So try to get the prices right, but also uh, new, new standards, um, efficiency standards, uh, but also uh, sort of behavioral economics uh, approaches or, or social marketing. Um, this said, what, what has been seen with efficiency standards is that you do have a strong rebound effect if the prices are not sufficiently high to correct for that. So the argument is you really need to have these different things, as well as the public investment. So for example, in the US, one of the things that's, that's infuriating is the country's, well, infuriating to some of us, is the country's inability to raise the price of energy, which is extremely, gasoline is extremely cheap. But there's an enormous public reaction against increasing the price of energy because most people are locked into a lifestyle that would make it personally extremely uh, difficult uh, to deal with higher uh, costs. Now in Europe, it's much easier to raise the price of gasoline because people typically can have access to decent public transportation or live or sufficiently close to, to their place of employment that they can cycle or walk. So, you know, in the US, for example, being able to develop a public transportation policy, having public investment, or in developing countries, having public investment to allow for the development of, of public transportation is also part and parcel of all of this. So the, the, the answer to the question is resource efficiency really cannot be achieved with a single policy, be it price or efficiency standards. Thank you. I have, um, I think, two questions, but somehow I would like to link them. Um, they have to do with trade, international trade. Um, you mentioned in your presentation all these new issues like green, um, um, inclusion, uh, resilience, you know, lots of new objectives, targets for policy. Um, so the first question is, how, do, how, does, how do the traditional targets like growth, well, okay, but for example, trade, you know, trade, liberalization, <coughs> which the World Bank used to have, how do they fit into the picture? Do they acquire some kind of new angle or maybe, you know, lower priority or whatever? This is the first question. The second question is, there may be a link. I'm not 100% sure, but I think there's a link between the um, inclusion aspect of <coughs> some environmental policies um, it was mentioned in Paul's presentation that energy subsidies can be very regressive, you know, and even green policies can be very re regressive, more affordable for rich countries, for example. And uh, you mentioned uh, Germany. There's another issue at the moment from the um, from the um, massive expansion of uh, renewables in Germany. It's that um, exports, electricity exports to other European countries depressing prices there occasionally and they are therefore making um, traditional uh, energy production from fossil industry, fossil uh, power production, making it less profitable. And that creates problems in other countries. So in a way, one country moving ahead creates problems for other countries and maybe also in other areas. So that's also linked to trade, you know. So it brings me back to the first question. If, if do you have a debate in the World Bank, you know, with all these new initiatives that you're taking on, on trade? Um, is there a new take on trade, the role of trade in this? 
Good set of questions. Yes, there's a lot of debates within the World Bank on all these topics. Um, so first of all, um, I think there is a broad agreement that trade per se is, I mean, trade is not an objective per se. I mean, trade is, is an objective to the extent that it enables growth, enables uh, development and so on and so forth. <coughs> um, and I would argue that, uh, so it, it remains as an important objective only in as much as it's perceived as serving development purposes. And one of the big debates, in fact, is on Africa, which is, you know, largely based on export of of, uh, of minerals and and uh, primary products, and how and whether or not this is in fact conducive to growth. And that's where the work on wealth has been extremely useful, because it enables us to see what, that, in fact, for many of these countries, the economic growth has come at the expense of the wealth uh, depletion of wealth. Um, so there is a debate already within the trade literature about this. Now, in the link between uh, trade and green policy, there is also, of course, a lot of debate about the need for coordination and whether countries can go at it alone. And that, I think, is also a big debate within Europe, but certainly in developing countries where there's this big fear that uh, by adopting more stringent environmental policies, they will lose out on job creation, they will lose on competitiveness. What's really useful is to look at the, the literature uh, on this, which is now over 20 years old. There's a lot of empirical result that shows that the impact of environmental policies tend to be fairly minimal on job creation. That, you know, there's always, whenever a new environmental regulation is introduced, the ex-ante estimates of its cost are invariably substantially higher than the ex post estimate. Um, in some cases, in a number of cases, there are there is some evidence that, uh, particularly in developing countries, that environmental policies can improve competitiveness. So for example, the Mexican food industry became much more competitive after Mexico introduced a number of environmental uh, safeguards and policies. So I think there, the, the, the at the same time, there's also been um, a whole debate about green jobs and about how you know everybody who started producing solar panels would suddenly develop a whole industry and create massive amounts of jobs. And one of the things we talk about in this report, and the OECD has also done some very interesting work on, is the fact that you know it's neither here nor there. There's no green jobs miracle, but there isn't also a green job disaster. So I think what we're trying to promote in general is this idea that there's a lot that countries can do by themselves without necessarily having to fear major loss in comp or any loss in competitiveness. The problem is that no country has yet introduced the kind of carbon pricing or the kind of uh, environmental policies and taxation that would be needed to get us to where we would be fully sustainable. So the truth is empirically, we don't know what would happen if one country truly went completely at it alone. And that's where the whole debate on border trade, border tax adjustment comes in. And uh, some colleagues at the World Bank recently issued a, a book on this topic where they were arguing that, in fact, border tax adjustment should maybe be an instrument that countries be allowed to use. Now, the WTO argues that environmental problems should be solved with environmental policies and not with trade policies. I don't know that it's really possible to do that. Thank you. Um, I think we need to stop. We have 20 minutes uh, for um, a coffee break. Uh, um, I'd like to thank all of you for participation in the first part of this session. Also, let me thank those who are watching this uh, conference uh, through the web, because it is streamlined and a lot of people who are now waiting for uh, the next part of the conference uh, without having the coffee break, which is reserved to all of you here in, in, in Milan. And let me conclude by, by thanking both speakers with a big round of applause. Thank you. Eleven thirty sharp, please.
uh, from uh, um, the European Commission. And uh, she's uh, giving us a, a, an additional uh, viewpoint, additional perspective on, uh, on uh, measurements of sustainable development and green growth, in particular a more operational one. We are moving for, from, uh, from a general uh, theoretical methodological framework to, a, to a, an operational approach uh, to implement uh, a set of indicators who are able to provide a good measurement of, uh, of sustainable development. Uh, we, this is why I'm very happy and pleased to have Michaela here today. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. For, to the, um, thank you to the uh, FEM team for inviting me here. It is the first time that I'm coming in Milan for, um, for these issues, on, just to discuss a little bit about composite indicators. Usually I travel all around Europe or in, uh, in the United States, but uh, being in Milan, sort of to my home uh, adopted country is, is really a privilege in, in a certain way. Um, so the team that I um, have been working on is uh, situated in, um, in Ispra, in Italy, at the northern part of Italy. And there we have been working on composite indicators since 2002. Here I will try to distill the knowledge that we gained and the lessons that we learned uh, having worked with these uh, quantitative measures trying to capture sustainability, education, lifelong learning, innovation, whatever. How, shall I, Actually, yes? Or, or maybe I can go there if it's yeah, easier. You can go there, Is right. it easier yeah, so that yeah. I don't? Yes. Exactly. Okay. If I were to ask maybe an economist or um, a person uh, saying, how would you measure the well-being of people? The most naive, simplistic answer would have been GDP per capita. Maybe that would have been the case a few years ago. But nowadays, everybody is very well aware that in order to measure what really matters in the life of the people, we need something that goes very well beyond GDP. And in fact, in uh, two recent reports, um, that were co-authored by Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, they have been urging statisticians to capture what really matters in the life of the people, and they are for not only GDP. On page seven of this uh, quite interesting book, uh, you would see that the role of statistical indicators has increased over the last two decades, and we would add that the reason why there has been this increase in this pieces of information in these indicators is because people are more statistically literate. There is more complexity around us that we try to capture. 100 years ago, nobody knew the word of sustainability, but so these are new notions that we need to capture somehow. And there is, of course, more information, society, the web, and so on. Probably the statistics are the best known face to general public and media. If we take a very old article from Economist and Economist Financial Times, many uh, journals or media do publish these types of measure. We would read that, uh, taking an exempt for Mauritius, arguing that uh, discussing the population. Is this the pointer? Oh, no. So maybe that's the pointer, the red one. So discussing you know, the, the population, the GDP, ranking first on the Mo Ibrahim Index that captures uh, corruption, that captures governance in Africa, 24th on the World Bank's ease of doing business. So you do see that you already have two statistical measures, population and GDP, accompanied by aggregate measures capturing governance and ease of doing business. And this is not the only case. If you take any article, any newspaper, in almost all uh, papers, either statistical ones or related to sports or whatever, you will find these aggregate measures. What is a composite indicator? A composite indicator, if we try to use the definition uh, adopted by the OECD, is uh, when we try to put together individual indicators and try to elicit from them a single number using an underlying model, hopefully or uh, some, some kind of conceptual reasoning for putting things together. There are advantages and disadvantages 
of having composite indicators. We are not particularly in favor of composite indicators as a, as a concept per se, but what is really appealing in, in using them is the fact that you can really summarize very complex notions that you can certainly not describe using a bunch of indicators. Also because using a set of indicators, sometimes you don't really worry about what is more important, what is less important. When you try to put things together, this is where the choices enter into play. So I would urge you to see the composite indicators more as a, as a starting point for debates, for discussions, rather than as the tools to take um, very concrete decisions. They do not suffice, but they are a very, very good starting point for the discussions. If we were to Google on, on Scholar Google, which is maybe considered an indication of publications um, on a certain topic, and we Google um, composite indicators within uh, inverted commas, you will see that uh, in 1950 there were only 30 uh, documents where composite indicators notion was mentioned, and nowadays we go to almost 12,000 documents. So you see this really exponential growth of composite indicators. Now obviously this is also linked to the use of internet. Right? It's not only composite indicators per se. But what is really important to see is that close to 2000, you have a tenfold increase over these last 10 years, which means that these measures are really entering into the policy debate. If I were to ask you now, just out of curiosity, how many of these articles, 2000 uh, articles, include the word sustainability? Could you give me a percentage? Just give me some percentages. 10%? 50%? Very good. Uh, 36%. So the first guess was quite right. So you see, more than one third of the documents related to composite indicators talk about sustainability. Hmm? Which means that really sustainability is probably the most um, widely captured notion through the use of an aggregate measure. Why? Because you can't easily capture it in any other way. Huh? Maybe there are models capturing some aspect of sustainability, but pretending that you can capture something such holistic and complex as sustainability, it's really um, a useful thinking. Certainly, you can't do it with a single composite indicator, but as we said, composite indicators should be seen as a starting point for discussion. And therefore, we should assess their conceptual relevance, whether they were built with statistically sound techniques and so on. So, and it has been increasing since 2012 already. It was just 28% in 2012. In this book, which is a little bit old, I mean, I think it is of 2009, there are quite a few composite indicators or even databases or simple indicators discussing sustainability. So for people that are eager uh, to work on this topic or have already been working on this topic, this is a very good um, uh, book. Uh, we have um, reviewed uh, some composite indicators discussing sustainability, and you will see it in, in this um, um, working paper of 2012, which was done as an audit for the Sustainable Society Index, and we will discuss it in more detail. But here um, we list more than 30 um, aggregate measures that capture some kind of societal progress more general, including, of course, the FEM index which, by the way, you will see it in more detail, but it has a unique feature. Uh, it is the only composite indicator that we have been aware of that embeds this kind of dynamic um, tool in order to predict what is going to happen in the future. Usually, composite indicators in all fields, not only sustainability, are really static. They use the available information now or the most recent piece of information, and they try to describe the situation now. But there is no way that you can sometimes assess the impact of policies. What if I change my scenario? And I think we will see it later on in um, Fabio's presentation on, on the added value of this composite indicator. Just a very brief overview of why I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of the team at the JRC because I really want to show you that having worked with so many different composite indicators, we can really see easily what goes on, uh, on and what goes wrong, often unnoticed by the developers of composite indicators. So in 2002, we started with the first article that we wrote. It was just a working paper on the state of the art on composite indicators. Then we launched in 2003 uh, the web server 
on composite indicators. Over these years, we have been doing annually seminars on aggregate measures on composite indicators. And um, just for the last couple of years, we have been working both with the European Commission and with external partners, for instance, with Yale and Columbia for uh, the environmental, um, it's there, somewhere there, for, with the environmental performance index or um, with the Sustainable Society Index for, with the Sustainable Society Foundation. So every year we get more than 10 requests by external organizations to help them revise their framework. And the added value from our side is really to look into the statistical properties of composite indicators. Because usually developers are more aware of the concept, of the relevance of the indicators, but of how many choices are entailed in trying to put these things together is not really their, um, their strong point. So we try to complement the work that the international organizations are doing with this type of analysis, looking into the statistical properties of composite indicators. And so here, I will try to give you these hints that we, uh, just um, maybe eight uh, suggestions that would be useful. Before going into that, um, just to uh, show you that together with uh, the OECD in 2008, we published the handbook on composite indicators where we give a decalogue, uh, 10 steps on how to go from the development of a conceptual framework to the selection of the indicators, how to treat missing data, outliers, how to use statistical analysis in order to understand the, concept, the coherence of the framework, how to decide on the weights and the aggregation and what are the alternative methods, how to do the robustness and sensitivity, how important it is to go back to the indicators because a composite indicator is not meant to be seen as a single number independently of the data set. It is meant to reveal something that you couldn't see before, but it has to be backed up by the underlying data. And we will see an example. How to associate with other variables or some policy relevant measures and how, of course, to present it and disseminate it. Maybe two um, composite indicators capturing some aspects of, um, of environmental performance or sustainability are described in, um, in Yale and Columbia's university, the Environmental Performance Index, and also in the Sustainable Society Index. I'm going to talk a little bit about these examples, not because I think that they are the best um, measures of sustainability or environmental performance, but because I'm very well aware of them since we worked with a team. So I can easily extract some key messages for you. So what you see is that although in, in this case they try to capture environmental performance, and here they try to capture the sustainable societies, and these indicators, the first group is described as the human well-being, this is the environmental well-being, and this is the economic well-being, you will see that there are many differences in the indicators, trying to capture similar things. In fact, if we were to make a simple um, case and give you, a set, and give you the same topic, describe sustainability in your own way, most likely each one of you would have come with a slightly different set of indicators. And this is really evident in the literature that whenever you try to um, describe a complex phenomenon, the data sets will be definitely different, depending on, on the regions that you try to capture. I'm discussing macro regions, or whether you are interested in the um, uh, NATS2 level, so within the European Union, looking at the regions, or whatever. So, so it really depends on the unit of analysis, what are the key messages that you try to elicit. So from this point on, I, will, I have really tried to summarize some, some suggestions. For those who develop, composite indicators of sustainability or any other topic. The first choice that needs to be made, and it's really, really important, it has to be a priori because it's conceptual rather than statistical, is how to put the things together. Let's assume that we did a good job in doing the literature review, asking the experts on what matters on sustainability. We chose this set of indicators. We will later on decide how to normalize, how to weigh the indicators, but we really have to understand what is the model behind this putting things together. And here I will just give you an example. Imagine that you have arrived at the dimension, you have a country where on the economy the normalized score is 5, on environment 9, 
and on social it is too. So you say, <coughs> shall I take a simple average of them? Hmm? <coughs> shall we take a simple average, arithmetic, or a geometric average? A geometric average is simply a multiplication instead of a summing. Now I will try to a little bit to, um, to give you some culture as to how you can choose your method. Imagine that, again, you have the example, the previous example, the country with 592 is here, and another country that has 777. Hmm? On average, these two countries, they, okay, on the arithmetic average, this country seems to be better. Hmm? If we were to do the geometric average, again, this country is better. But what you see is that the difference is a little bit bigger, right? In fact, in the arithmetic average, you see that the country that has an equal performance across the dimensions gets, obviously, the geometric average the same. While if it is uneven, you see it is uneven because it has a 2, a 5, and a 9, so the 9 would compensate for the 2, but a little bit less, so it has a less score. The point that I will try to make here is that if the country that has an uneven performance across its dimensions improves, it can improve by five points. I assume that this improvement uh, is not really related to money, or it is, but whatever. It can improve by five points. So it goes from five to 10. Its score would be seven under the arithmetic average, and its score under the geometric average would be 5.6. So you see that under the, the arithmetic average, it improved a lot, under the geometric, less. If it were to improve, uh, on the dimension where it used to be weak, so on the dimension where it was doing two, so these five points are added here to seven, under the arithmetic average, there has been no particular improvement compared to the previous one, so it is a seven. Because the arithmetic average, the simple average, doesn't care where you improve as long as you improve. The geometric average formula, you see that from 4.5, it went to 6.8. It improved the same amount, five points, but it improved on the weak dimension. It improved where it was doing bad. Huh? So a country like uh, Qatar, if it was on the uh, on economy, it's doing very well, but on life expectancy and edu education, is doing poorly. If you are to use an arithmetic average, it doesn't matter where you improve. If you use the geometric average, you say to Qatar, no, look, in order to show off better on the scale, you need to improve where you are weak. And this is probably the notion that you have to think behind the sustainability. On issues, when putting things together on economy, uh, environment, and the social dimension, you can't say improve wherever you want or wherever you can. No, improve where you're weak. And this is the, the statistics behind choosing the right aggregation formula. Now, with this example, I don't want to say that the right formula is the geometric average, but the right formula is not the arithmetic average. Hmm? And in many, many cases, people take simple averages, but you see that there is no value in, in these notions of sustainability. And I just gave you this example just to make you think a little bit outside this box of let's take an average of things. It doesn't work on issues of sustainability. And this is a little bit what I described here. <clears throat> the next advice or suggestion that I would give for those that are carrying out surveys on understanding the weights behind, uh, so the, the importance of the different dimensions or sub-dimensions that you have in your index. I'm gonna give this example that comes from a poverty assessment. Every three uh, indicators belong to the same group, so the experts were asked um, to assign weights. These bars represent the average of 42 experts and these um, uh, confidence intervals are two times the standard deviation of, um, of the respondent's answers. What is really interesting in this type of analysis is that you will see towards the end, these three, these three, and these three, they are close to 33%, so they are very close to equal weighting. What happened in this case is that by showing to the experts 10 different groups of indicators that capture the different dimensions of our index, Towards the end, they may have been tired. Hmm? So they may have assigned equal weights just because of tiredness. This is something that you cannot really correct after you have done the survey. So it's really important that some of your experts, if you do this expert-based uh, weighting, some of your experts see some of the dimensions first and the others, the others. Hmm? 
And this way, you are sure that you are not going to have this possible effect of uh, tiredness. While other issues, such as uh, country bias or the sample bias, if it's a smaller, you can certainly correct it afterwards. But this is really, really important to be done a priori. Otherwise, it may uh, invalidate your entire survey. The other thing that I would uh, suggest when you do expert-based weighting is to try somehow to measure the inconsistency. If we were to ask experts to assign the importance of indicators and somebody says it's 30, 20, and 50, you have really no way to assess whether the expert did his job right. There are techniques. One of them is the analytic hierarchy process. I'm not going to go into details, but one of them is analytic hierarchy process that gives you a measure of inconsistency because it asks pairwise comparison. So it says on a semantic scale from one to nine, where one is equal importance, if an indicator is more important than another. And you do this for all the pairs. Obviously, some questions are asked twice, but the expert is not really able to see that during the process. And therefore, there will be some measure of inconsistency. And I'm giving this because I think that also FEM did not use this method, but used something where tries to capture inconsistency. And this is really, really important when you try to assess the expert-based weighting scheme. Another uh, suggestion to give you, and this is a very easy test for everybody to do, you don't need to be um, statisticians, is to look into the statistical coherence of the data set. This is the set of indicators underlying the Sustainable Society Index. These are the uh, sub-dimensions. What you see is that these are the simple Pearson correlation coefficients, nothing else, uh, nothing fancy. The simple Pearson correlation coefficients of the indicators with their own dimension. The assumption in the development of the index is that the three indicators are equally important in, in basic needs. And if you look at these values, they're relatively similar. So here, and this is the case as well here, although 52 is a little bit lower and so on. But at least it's, you don't see something particularly eye-catching. Maybe here, maybe here you would see that um, in the case of transition, for instance, organic farming is really determining the score of that dimension compared to the other one. Ah, another thing that is really important when you do these simple tests is to make sure that there are no negative correlations, that there are no random correlations, practically values close to minus 0 0.3 up to 0 0.3, uh, close to zero. And you do match the, the weights. The weights, the notion of importance and these correlation coefficients should be very near. Hmm? I'm not going to go into too many details, but I really want you to get a flavor of these issues. Um, if we look at the environmental performance index, the 2012 version, how can I, will you just tell me five minutes because I'm not sure, okay. Um, if we look at the environmental performance index, the latest version, the 2012, and the new one will be launched again in January 2014, you will see that Based on the weights that they were assigned here, 30% and 70%, this was, by the way, this is the first time that they did 30 and 70% to the two main dimensions, capturing environmental health and ecosystem vitality. But this does not mean that they wanted to, the ecosystem vitality to be more important. They assigned these unequal weights in order to make the importance of the two dimensions relatively equal. <coughs> because in the arithmetic averages, they have been using, the weights and the importance are not really the same thing. Hmm? The weights are simply multiplicative when we make the product of the weight multiplied by the value and we sum up these pieces. But the importance is, is more seen through a scatter plot of the overall index versus the underlying indicators. If you see a, a nice linear pattern, it means that your indicator has an impact on the index. If you see blurred picture, so random points, then whether the, whether the indicator is in the framework or not, it's just cosmetic. So this is sort of cheating, but not knowing it. Hmm? It is very, very important on, on notions of sustainability or any composite indicators in general, not to have negative correlations between your underlying dimensions. And now I'm discussing negative correlations, so plots like this one at a higher level, eh? once you have already normalized your data. So this is already at the dimension level. 
And what we see there is that for the Sustainable Society Index, <clears throat> it was unavoidable that the human well-being that is on the um, horizontal axis was negatively associated to the environmental well-being and negatively associated to the economic well-being. There you say, did we make something wrong? No. It seems that the way the, the indicators were, those indicators selected, they do show that there is a trade-off, that countries that are very good uh, on their economic performance, they do so at the expense of the environment. With this set of indicators, this is the message that they convey. And this is, again, the same message that we would get if we would look at the environmental performance index. And what is it that could go wrong? And you wouldn't notice it. You say, fine, I mean, I, I still may take the average of the three dimensions, economy, uh, society, and environment, even if I have this negative correlation. I'll show you with a very simple example what can go wrong and that you would not notice it. Imagine that you have these eight countries. These are the underlying scores on two indicators. We normalize them with the best getting 100 and everything else linearly. Their sum is here, the average. Huh? So it's just 50% uh, percent of this indicator and 50% percent of this one. And this is the overall rank. Now, in, in this scenario, the best country improves. So the best country improved here. It was 500 before. It simply became 700. Nothing else changed. We simply recalculate the values. This country remained first, but do you see what happened to the others? The second, third, and so on, this is the previous rank, they inverted. But then you say, wait a minute, I had a ranking. The best country improved, and now the last country is second? There must be a mistake. This is the problem when you put things together with a, with a negative correlation. Hmm? In fact, this is the picture that you had, there was a negative correlation, and this is why it happened. Huh? Then you may say, but this is an example that you made artificially. Well, I urge you to look at the previous graph and look what would have happened. So these countries here have exactly the same pattern and this country over there. So it will happen in your data set, maybe not in a such pompous way, right, that the uh, second country becomes last, but it will happen within there and you will not even notice it. So avoid negative, uh, avoid aggregating at least with an arithmetic average negatively correlated uh, dimensions. The next advice relates to <clears throat> testing. How robust the country scores, the country ranks, or whatever it is that you're measuring, are to the assumptions. The aggregation function, the weights, the normalization, what if we put this set of indicators or another, and so on. And what is really important is that you test simultaneously the changes, not one at a time. And there is this very nice book on the flow of the averages, where you have this shaking the assumptions one at a time or together, it's a totally different thing. You will see totally different things. And we are <coughs> suggesting to do this kind of analysis. <coughs> Just an example, when you do, um, now here you don't see obviously the assumptions that were changed on this index, on the environmental performance index. But what I really want to try to show you is that you would see that for some countries, the, the um, reference rank, so the one published by the international organization, is really well outside this confidence interval. Does it mean that they did something wrong? No, but it simply means that for those countries that are outside the interval, this uh, score and rank is really associated to the methodology that they chose. And if they had chosen something else, they would have told a totally different picture. While for other countries, things are pretty much robust. It's also interesting in these types of analysis to see which countries are really volatile. Volatile countries showing the very high um, intervals here. Hmm? Again, this picture, if, it is, uh, if an index is robust or not, it doesn't mean that the index is bad or not. It doesn't say anything about the quality of an index. What it says is that the index is really multidimensional, so it brings together heterogeneous concepts and therefore, as soon as you play with the assumptions, your message will be different. Okay. Five, three. The next suggestion is to combine the uncertainty analysis with the sensitivity analysis. The sensitivity analysis will tell you which of the assumptions that you are testing is more important. And this is just an example from the innovation indicator, where at the beginning, before doing this analysis, countries, the member states, were really 
spending a lot of time saying whether we should estimate the missing data or not, arguing that we should not estimate the missing data because we make an error. So there was a lot of energy and time on that uh, issue. If you do the sensitivity analysis, you'll see that the imputation, huh, the estimation of missing data, is the least important. So this type of analysis will tell you, look, we may argue here for days as to whether we should estimate the missing data or not and how, but it doesn't really matter. What matters are other choices. So this type of analysis done during the, um, the development of an index will help you understand where to focus your energy and on your discussions. The next suggestion, as we said, um, relates to deconstructing the index and therefore accompanying the overall uh, score and country rank with the underlying information. And this can be done both at the country level, so for each country, country profiles with detailed information on, now obviously if you have 80 indicators, you wouldn't list 80 indicators, but maybe the main dimensions. Hmm? Uh, but at least you, you do reveal how the country is doing, with respect to its income group, to its geographic group. You, you can be creative, but you should always accompany an index, a number, with the underlying information. Or you could do it at the indicator level, showing, for example, on here there was also proximity to target notion, so showing, for instance, that um, on this indicator, most countries are close to the target, while here they are very well beyond the target, um, below the target. So these pieces of information, which would not have probably come up if you had worked on a, on a simple data set. Why? Because you wouldn't even have tried to compare the indicators together. They only come during the process of a, of a composite indicator building. And the final suggestion is to link it to policy. This is just an example from an alcohol policy index that we did with um, the New York Medical College. It was based on the WHO uh, framework. And it is based on a set of indicators related to the effect to some policies, for instance, selling or not to young people um, alcohol and so on. What we see is that on this vertical, on this horizontal axis, you have the score on the on the aggregate score, and on the vertical axis, you have the consumption of um, of ethanol per person per year. What you see is that the stricter a country is on its policies. These are the policies, the 16 policies. The stricter a country is, the less, uh, on average, people consume. So there is a kind of a link to something that we are evidencing. And these countries, Hungary, Mexico, and Turkey, they are really behaving as outliers in this case, but for very good reasons. For instance, Mexico, they consume tequila, and tequila is not really captured by ethanol, so it's a totally different reason. Turkey, they are uh, Muslim people, so they don't consume but for, uh, ethic, for um, religious reasons. And Hungary is one of the countries where, uh, poor, uh, where many laws are poorly enforced. So you do get them by, uh, you see, this message came through a composite indicator, hmm? linking it to something that has meaningful to society, like the consumption of, of ethanol. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm concluding. I will just read the... Um, and the final um, suggestion for you is that we do need power, a powerful evidence-based narrative supported by good statistical measures and good analytic work. So these are a possibility which should not be left untried. We need relevant and sound composite or indicators in general. And I conclude here, and I will leave the floor to, to Fabio. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. <coughs> uh, oh, uh, in the previous cases, there are questions, comments, uh, clarifications that you are needing? No? Too, too complex? We are moving into a more detailed analysis. Uh, I was complex. <laughs> Look. You, you mentioned the problem of a rank reversal. But you say that uh, the problem is due to the fact that on the way in which you aggregate the indicator, maybe it is better to say that it is due to the way in which you normalize the data. Because the way in which you normalize the data by the mean max uh, method is not a good way to normalize data. So, for example, the way in which we normalize the data in FEM size uh, by the use of value function that uh, allows you to be independent of a data set so you don't have a problem with like reverse. I will explain to you about this a simple case study. Even if you had done Z-scores, you would still have the problem. 
And this is not because of the normalization, it's because of the negative correlation. So even if we had done something else, distance to the best performer, Z scores, something though that it doesn't take the rank, hmm? you would still have the problem. So it's not a problem of the normalization in that case. Hmm? But certainly normalization plays an important role in the development of, an, of a composite indicator, so it has to be carefully selected. In this presentation, I selected only just a few examples of what we found that can go wrong and often goes unnoticed. Hmm. Other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Michaela. And uh, let's, let's move to Fabio. Fabio has been working uh, uh, and uh, coordinated a team of uh, researchers uh, who develop uh, the new version of the FEMSI indicator. And now he will tell us what's new in this, uh, in this version, what other results have been uh, obtaining uh, uh, with the newly developed indicator. Uh, taking into account that the, the effort is, has been both on normalization, on aggregation, and on the dynamics on the indicator, as Michaela uh, just just mentioned, all these dimensions have, have, be, have been developed to, to exactly to 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 match uh, possible criticism coming from what what you have been showing uh, in your very nice presentation, Fabio. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me start thanking uh, joining uh, Professor Carraro, Dr. San Marco, all the people that. Uh, are here to attend in this conference, also people that are following on the web, and also, of course, the distinguished speakers that have already gave their own uh, view on this uh, kind of important issue. And my presentation logically flows on what was uh, said in the morning, especially for what Michaela said uh, on, uh, specifically on terms of the steps that uh, she showed on the handbook, uh, how to construct the composite indicators from OECD. So I thank this for warming up my presentation. I will give, uh, um, I will start with main motivation for this. There can be a disputable <laughs> index. We, this morning we learned that uh, there are different view on the composite indicators that can be more helpful or not on the policy side. What is basically, and this, is, this slide basically uh, answer to the question of why one more index? There are many, some 12,000 index on Google, and maybe it's just a part of them uh, cope with sustainability. But basically, we have uh, in literature and also from institutions based not only academia, we have many list of indicators. We have a few composite indicators by now, but uh, all the above, our main point is that uh, all the above monitor the historical trend. There are no looking forward <coughs> composite indicators. Do we need such a, an indicator that looks to the future trends? We believe that this is quite important value added of our work because uh, we try to make some ex ante assessment of what can be the future trends in sustainability all across the world. So this is the main motivation. I have some more slides, but we'll not spend much time on the give just an overview, which are basically the many most important, the most recognized list of indicators in the worldwide, but also we have some experience I want also to bring to the knowledge of who's working, for example, in other parts of the world. We have some experience in Europe with European 2020 that monitor five indicators, and the Eurostat also has a list of 11 indicators to take under control to monitor the progress across European countries. We have some experience in Italy from ISTA. There is some representative from ISTA here that work on the Benessere Equin Sostenibile in list of indicators. I like very much, for example, this because they include the landscape indicator, the landscape dimension that very often is neglected in the list of indicators usually we, we work with. Then there is also some other experience. As I said, many limitations of list of indicators is that uh, the overall sustainability at all levels of governance, local, country, and worldwide, is uh, possibly difficult to evaluate and compare. So how the different dimensions can move when, for example, you think about a policy that specifically addresses just one dimension, for example, social, what can be the trade-off or the synergies with the environmental dimension? This can be something that is important to uh, study. I have just a, a definition of composite indicators coming from Rio 2012, just a combination of individual indicators. There is the OECD handbook that is a sort of Bible for us to see how we can construct the, indicate, the uh, composite indicators. Of course, so we are aware about the concern from the Stiglitz and Fitosi Commission that is uh, the difficulty to 
to have aggregate indicators because they are very heterogeneous, are very different among them. So how we can uh, aggregate uh, these, uh, these uh, a lot of arbitrary components. Well, worldwide we have still a list of, uh, not exhaustive, uh, a list of composite indicators. They, for example, Human Development Index is very often used, but uh, it completely disregard the environmental component. Very often in, um, in recent seminars, you can see that the Human Development Index, index is coped with the ecological footprint to have all the dimensions covered, including the environmental dimensions. We have some sophisticated general savings, savings issue other composite indicators. In Italy, we have uh, several experience from this. We should watch the public because why they cannot listen. I watch very often the public. <laughs> yeah, always. <laughs> okay, main drawback from this list, of, this also composite indicator, as I said, that they will not provide an excellent assessment of what will be in the future, possible trend in the future. So this is what we try, our group of um, people, our group of researchers try to to do is basically see how sustainability may evolve in the future. This can be something that can be interesting also for policymakers. And uh, we do this uh, building a new framework, so we use a different, a new approach. In uh, we use, we can play with different assumptions, economic, social, environmental driver. We consider a set, non-exhaustive set of uh, policy scenarios for sustainability, to improve sustainability in different dimensions. And we have uh, this as such in the disciplinary approach. I will give you more detail on the methodological side. This basically uh, recalls the step from my okay, Michaela number two, uh, if I remember four, five, six uh, steps. It is basically fair on how you can select the indicators in a proper way according to the model you are using in this case, how we can normalize, how you, how you can aggregate. Let me start uh, from uh, what is new in FEMA site 2013. And this raised the problem that it's difficult to compare the different issues. This project start, started in 2009. Then the, every two years we have a new release. It's very difficult to compare. Uh, and I was talking with someone during the coffee break. Uh, wh how was, for example, how behaved Italy in the previous issue? How now is, uh, is improved or not? Well, it's difficult because you have many, many different, uh, for example, you have a few more indicators that can explain different sustainability. We have um, a new kind of scenarios. Especially we have a new expert solicitations, we have, we have new weights for the different components. I will, I will tell you, I will show in a couple of slides, this is very, very important because it changed a lot the picture of sustainability. And uh, then, first of all, the main, I think the, maybe the main limitation for those that uh, who expect a large number of indicators in this uh, composite indicator is that uh, we need to have some screening of criteria for choosing indicators that we can plug in in our model. And basically, we have a worldwide coverage of uh, sustainability, so we need that uh, Missing data are uh, low and are few enough because otherwise for a whole continent, sometimes you don't have any record of historical data, so you cannot use to calibrate your model in the base here. You, the indicators then should be, we, we need to compute indicators in the future. So we need some is empirical evidence from the past to project then in a proper way in the future indicators. And then, of course, we need some target benchmarks available for normalization purposes. This is our idea of indicator in the sense that this is the components of the, our composite indicator for 2013. It's basically the same uh, structure of uh, previously of 2011. We add these four indicators, two, two for the social component that are corruption and uh, access to um, internet, uh, so in terms of internet users. For environment, we also add the waste generation and material intensity that also matters a lot now in terms of policy making. Just a caveat, when we talk about economy, very often we only consider gross domestic product. Uh, and according to our view, this is incorrect because we need some more dimensions within the economic pillar that are basically some part that we call the growth drivers that refer to investment and more specifically in R&D investment, research and development investment, and also the exposure to domestic international issues that we capture through the public debt and also relative trade balance. 
I just have this slide to see, we, we make some comparison with other list of indicators to see at which extent we are far away from the rest of the literature. As you can see, the, uh, we have uh, the Green Growth uh, um, Initiative, the UNEP SD are the list that are contained in the Green Growth Knowledge Platform report uh, released last May 2013. And we see that uh, we have uh, some good uh, overlapping with the environmental indicators from, uh, uh, of course, uh, the list uh, from UNEP SD are quite long, uh, much longer. But while the environmental pillar is quite well covered, the social, we have some, um, let's say, some overlapping again. For example, we have some indications such as education expenditure, but usually when you look at education, you, uh, in indicators are literacy rate that are very difficult to replicate in our model, but it's a good proxy, as I will show you later. Also in terms of, um, for example, life expectancy, private health. For example, corruption is something that is not covered at all from our other list of indicators, but we, we think, and also experts, I will show you, think that it's quite important to explain the level of sustainability. And also on the economics, as I was saying, in terms of economics, uh, it seems that um, other list of indicators do not consider something that can be very crucial to explain uh, the sustainability. Okay. Just a few words, I don't have time, I need another workshop to explain <laughs> the behavior of the model, but just this is a model-based index. This is a model that we in FIM use normally for climate change uh, impacts and uh, policy economic assessment. We extend, so the, the basic of this model is basically that we have a stylized behavior for economic agents. So we have firms that are profit maximizers, households that are utility maximizer. This is not surprising. This is how actually agents behave. Maybe not in this clever way, but at least they try to maximize their own uh, functions, objective functions. There is a lot of interaction occurring within the economic system due to future economic development. But this is important. This is what we improve the model, extending social and environmental indicators within this macroeconomic model in order to capture the interactions among different dimensions of sustainability. So this is also very important. It's quite an ambitious project in this term, but we try to make all our effort to improve the model time by time. Okay, then just a few words on normalization. There are different ways to do this. We use, uh, let's say, the more general way. That is, uh, first, we rescale all the indicators. You know that something is expressed in dollars. Sometimes uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, indicators are expressed in, uh, in uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gases in uh, gigatons of carbon, so it's difficult. So we need the first to bring it to the same scale between zero and one. And then we try to define class of sustainability, and then, uh, According to the benchmark targets from literature, we try to define different classes. This is not, not very, very trivial because sometimes you don't have, for intermediate classes, specific uh, thresholds to define different classes of sustainability. But we try to do this work. We, we work on this, uh, we, we spend some time on defining the right classes through the benchmarking approach. In terms of uh, preference elicitation, already Michaela said all the complexity of this step. And the, the main novelty in this activity was that we do not ask anymore directly the value for the specific index, but we ask for what you think given a specific scenario, which is your preference among different scenarios in which different components are behave bad in poor way or in a very good way. So this is very important. So we make a scenario, in the, we ask experts to give their opinion on the interpretation of different scenarios. Of course, uh, you don't have uh, very good, very good, very good for all the components. It's quite easy. You can, it's preferable to other scenarios. We need to have uh, some intermediate uh, strange combination in which the trade-offs emerge. In this way, we are able to elicit uh, the opinion of experts. Okay, we have uh, some idea about, some analysis about complementarity sustainability. We have a, a robustness, robustness and sensitivity analysis to see if, how stable are our experts. Something that maybe we can, I can bring to the attention, who we should choose as uh, indeed uh, experts. We, we, we talk about experts, we talk about stakeholders, we talk about decision makers. Sometimes it can be a little bit confusing this. My personal view, and I want to bring to the table, to the floor, also to the table, to other uh, speakers and audience, that uh, when you talk uh, specific on a specific nest, that is a specific dimension, environment, social, and, and economic, you need possibly some experts. The top nest, that is, 
What you prefer between economy, environment, and society? Indeed, it's something that all of us can respond because it's just per subjective perception. So basically, experts, but the top choice between the three top dimensions can be open to everybody. Everybody can dispute, can say, I think in a different way, everything can be acceptable. Okay, just to go in a very, I wrote a lot of, we wrote a lot of, uh, just to make it simpler, use a sort of weighted average, okay, according to the caveats from Michaela on the arithmetic uh, weighting. Also consider the incoherence index that she was uh, referring about. We have a non-additive non -additive measure in order to consider also redundancy and synergies among the different dimensions. And then uh, through the Schoke integral, we are able to aggregate in one single component according to the weights given by experts. What is important here, unfortunately, maybe you cannot see very well, but we have a measure for the relative importance of the different components. The most important maybe is at the very top, that is how our pool of experts believe it is relatively important, economic, with respect to society, environment. And uh, I'm not really <laughs> the average voter in this case, because, for instance, what emerged that the society, in the previous issue, were uh, weighted quite one-third, one-third, one-third. In this case, we have the society environment matters much more than economics. It's economy. It seems to me that it's quite a, maybe a developed country's perspective. Many people from India that are following by streaming can say, look, we are still, we need to improve more on the economic pillar <laughs> rather than social and environmental. And it's, but in this case, we were lucky in expanding our pool of experts, although I go to my memory, I try to remember that there is some experts from Ecuador and Thailand. So even if we improve a little bit the heterogeneity between experts, we have still this kind of outcome. And for each nest, for each subnest, we have all this kind of relative importance. I also put some importance for different nests, what you can see also within each pillar, what is more important. This is sort of going back to the indicators to see which is more important, what Michaela said. Okay, let's go to the results. I think that is something that you want to, to know a little bit more in detail. There is no time to give you all the results. You can refer to the website, in which you can see the, all the results we have in terms of um, maps, for instance, for all dimensions uh, for three different years today, 2020, 2030. You may have the different, uh, what happens in terms, in this case, you have a global picture of sustainability. You can have also this kind of information as you see at the very beginning of this workshop, also for the different pillar. Okay, so as you can see from this picture, uh, what is also reported in the, um, in the handout you have, uh, um, that basically still, once again, there is some uh, uh, delay in sustainability in the Africa and especially in Asia. In Asia, because uh, Asia is starting growing a lot, but uh, the point is that uh, they are polluting a lot. Um, I, I correct uh, a little bit Michaela's slide on, uh, on uh, the different indicators because it's true that we have 40 countries. Indeed, we have 40 positions in our ranking because our ranking is worldwide. The problem is that for computational issue, we group the least developing countries just in bundles. So we have 40 positions. We can see the top three countries are Sweden, Norway, and Switzerland. You have this kind of, uh, you can play with different dimensions. In this case, you have FIMSI ranking on the horizontal axis and the gross domestic product per capita and vertical axis. You can play with different dimensions on the web. You can see, for instance, that Italy is the, the 20th place in this special ranking. It is uh, quite, be quite behind the rest of Europe, uh, unless some Mediterranean countries, for instance, are Portugal and Greece. The United States uh, is uh, not very well uh, behaving in this, in this ranking because uh, the high, you know that uh, the high econo economic dimension, very good economic dimensions, is in spite of a very bad environmental performance. India closes uh, our special ranking here, it's not surprising. And uh, okay, in this slide, I just put uh, several indicators. It's not very clear, but as you can see, for instance, that uh, 
f even if Sweden is at the very top, is the first uh, in our ranking. Indeed, uh, Norway is uh, a little bit better in terms of society and econo economy. The problem is the environmental dimensions in Norway. <laughs> uh, just for comparison, I put also the ranking from the Human Development Index that you maybe can compare not only with our aggregate indicator, but also with the society, maybe with the society dimension. As you can see, that in this case, Norway is indeed the first country, while Sweden at the seven places, Switzerland nine, Italy is the 25th place. So in the, also in this case, uh, we, we are a little bit uh, far away from the rest of European, North and uh, Central European countries, okay? But this is not uh, surprising. Okay, what I want to deliver, and now I have uh, several results on future perspective. Just uh, let me say, that the, what we are proposing today is not uh, an exhaustive set of policies. We are just uh, in, in presenting to all the audience where we have a quite flexible tool for scenario analysis, both in terms of reference scenario that is a no policy scenario, a baseline scenario, but also in terms of policy. We need to make a choice at the very beginning to present our results, but indeed we can use, we can see it with policymaker. And the, the flexibility that Paul was saying about uh, you can give uh, a different weights according to your perception. In this case, is, uh, we can choose your own scenario. We can plug with our model, creating new scenarios. For instance, for reference scenario, we are uh, mainly with Professor Cadaro working on, uh, work on the climate change uh, economic assessment. This is the, new, the set of new scenarios for the climate change community. We start working on the social economic pathways, <coughs> number two, that now will be used also in the fifth assessment report from IPCC. This is, I, I tried to characterize a little bit this, uh, uh, this uh, um, scenario. For instance, the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals will be delayed by several decades, so it's not very good, uh, a good scenario. You can see that, for, exam for example, you have also the scenario number one that is called sustainability. So next steps for us is working also on different scenarios to see how evolve the sustainability in different reference scenarios. Okay, then we have assembled in terms of environment, reduction and reduce and energy intensity at historical rates, so will be not a larger improvement in terms of energy intensity. Okay, then I just have a slides in which I put what we have, what, can, what we can a little bit calibrate in our model, something that derives from exogenous sources, that is, for instance, the gross domestic per, per capita is given for this uh, SSP2 scenario, also information on populations. But there are a lot of variables, uh, also in social environmental terms, that are left free to work with, within our model. So we cannot control for them. So this is very important because we cannot modify the sustainability according to our view. The important is how you can plug, plug in in the model, how you can construct the behavior of the indicator over time. This is very important. Okay, this is the reference scenario. In this table, we show basically how the sustainability will change moving from 2013 to 2013. And as you can see, there are no dramatic changes. This is in the reference scenario. I think this is not surprising. Maybe several changes are the, the bottom part of the ranking. There is because the, in, in terms of development, there will be different speed across countries. But I mean, it's not nothing surprising. Just that you can see the Switzerland go a little bit, uh, 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 just go um, replace uh, Norway at the second place because still Norway is not able to remove all the fossil fuels energy that is uh, producing. Okay, then you have also still on our website, you have also in the handout um, some information about uh, who that what what which component determines mainly the reduction of the increase uh, in uh, sustainability. And you can see, for instance, we choose this kind of picture because you can choose that. All around the world, there is a reduction in the environmental dimension that can affect uh, usually negatively the, the overall sustainability of a country, in this case, of a group of, of <laughs> countries. For example, at the world level, you see that uh, there is a quite reduction in sustainability. And this is uh, explained, uh, especially from the environmental deterioration worldwide. So let's move to the social, to the policy, the set of policy we were thinking about to see, to measure how things can change in the future. Here, maybe it's not very clear, but uh, maybe you can help with the colors. <laughs> this is basically the um, outcome from the last uh, Millennium Development Goals report. 
And you can see that the green uh, cells denotes where the targets uh, will be achieved by 2015. The red cells are the, pro the real si problematic situation. But the one main conclusion from Millennium Development Goals report is that even if we are able to achieve uh, in different regions targets, is still not enough. So we need to move farther from this, even if we can see some green lights. In we um, you, we so, uh, thought about the social policy up 2030 that move basically with the goal number two that uh, refers to education, a goal four, five, six in terms of, uh, of uh, um, life expectancy also or other health uh, problems. Here you have the list of social poli of policy uh, goals uh, deriving from the new report from the United Nations Solution Sustainable Development Solution Networks that are the so-called Sustainable Development Goals. And you have a number of, uh, um, of goals and the Basically, we are focusing on the number three, referring to education, and number five, referring to health. So what we uh, simulate in this case uh, are, for is, are uh, the achievement of the, what is uh, uh, delivered by now from the working groups at the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. That is, developed countries should at least achieve the 5% of education expenditure of gross domestic products, and at least 3% of public expenditure of gross domestic product to improve education and health conditions. Okay, the normal indicators are, as I said before, are life expectancy, literacy rates, but indeed what we emerge from the Human Development Index, that there is a relationship between the expenditure on health and education and the Human Development Index, as you can see from this picture, with some lag because the expenditure for 2000, Human Development Index for 2012, but still there is a positive correlation between expenditure in those sectors and the Human Development Index. Okay, social policy implementation, I just play a little bit with these uh, uh, arrows to say that in several countries, uh, we all only, uh, as the, health, the public health expenditure already is at the threshold, we only imply a subsidy in terms of edu to improve the education expenditure. Some, only for Middle East, uh, there is a problem still, they are far uh, below the threshold for what regards health. <laughs> Unfortunately, for many, many developed countries, still we have uh, quite far away from the thresholds. And th this is a, a, some idea of results we can give in terms of policy. I put one country, rest of Latin America, Middle East, and India, respectively, for those that work on education, health, and also for the both channels, education and health. As you can see, for instance, India can benefit a lot from this social policy. You can see the social pillar, for instance, increased by, by some 70%. There is, of course, the, the, this, the more distant you are from the target, the more you can improve, the higher will be the cost of the policy. For sure, you have, for instance, that uh, this kind of policy in 2030 will cost some, three per, some more than 3% of gross domestic product. But the message we want to deliver to policymakers is that if you look at the overall sustainability, how we can define so with the different weights for the components, you have a quite large improvement. Maybe it doesn't work, okay. You have some 70% in the terms of uh, improvement. So even if the policy is costly, our idea is that uh, to suggest to make some improvement in terms of education and health for India, the same for other countries. For the less developed countries, you can see that on average, the improvement in social and also responsibility will be lower, but the, the cost is very, very marginal. So we believe that uh, implementing social policy and so achieving the thresholds that were suggested from the United Nations is something that can be done very opportunely. Environmental policy. In this case, uh, we are implementing uh, something that is related to the water system, the water use system, but also, of course, of the climate change. So what we are basically implementing is a climate policy Professor Carraro, I think, uh, believes that this will be a fantastic outcome from the Varsav conference, that uh, really we can implement a fully flexible carbon market. <laughs> this is quite difficult to achieve on the um, on negotiations. But what we, in this case, uh, what we try to simulate is a fully flexible carbon market. 
involving all developed and BRICS countries, trying to achieve by 2030, with respect to 1990, a reduction of 40% of carbon dioxide emissions. This is a very, very ambitious target. And also in terms of water strategy, there is some policy that they're trying to improve the efficiency in water use. This is something that is also important to see how water pressure is very, very important item today. Okay, this is just a, I have a picture of, of the countries that are involved in this kind of market mechanism. And we have this kind of important results. Okay, Italy, for instance, will be one main player. And uh, as you can see, even if Italy benefits a lot from the financial crisis that uh, now it seems that is quite in line with the Kyoto Protocol, <laughs> with the Kyoto in the 2020 uh, 20 targets, it seems that if it uh, is able to reduce, uh, to participate to this kind of, uh, um, of uh, agreement in terms of reduction of uh, climate change emissions, uh, it will be quite costly, some 6% uh, of the gross domestic products but will be an improvement in terms of environmental dimensions and also of the overall sustainability. Just to address something that uh, um, Marianne Fay uh, was saying before, we didn't account here for impacts, and the, there is, there is, the answer is very simple, because 2030 is a too short time horizon. You, as you know, the uh, the real problem of climate change will be in the second part of the century. We already now, we know what is uh, what happened in the Philippines is something that can be somewhat related to climate change for sure. But still we have, uh, st still the, uh, the damages from climate change are not really tangible by now. So that's why we just make this analysis net from climate change impacts. Otherwise the improvement will be even higher for sure. The United States uh, with a much more expenditure with respect to Italy can improve much more in terms of environmental and in terms of sustainability. This is basically because the structure of the economic system in the US is very fossil fuel intensive. So moving to a reduction in, in, in greenhouse gases emissions will improve a lot. And uh, as, you, as you can see, for, for instance, China, which is the problem from China, for instance, uh, they will possibly pay more money than uh, developed countries as uh, they have uh, what we call in, uh, in general in our literature, lower marginal cost of abatement. So basically it will be a net seller of permits. And this is why they, this implies that uh, the reduction will be higher. And for instance, uh, the improvement will be lower than US. So this is just a way to create a mechanism uh, for a carbon market. We can think of many, many different uh, ways. Okay, very, very important, this is maybe my final results, is that, for instance, if you look at least developed countries that do not participate to the international carbon system, they have an improvement in terms of gross domestic product, they also slight in terms of sustainability, but there is a reduction in terms of environmental dimension. This is due to the uh, so-called leakage effect. That is, they can benefit from the fact that they do not participate to this kind of agreement. And then the policy maker, once again, must, should decide it is, if this is an outcome that they desire. Okay, we have some slide. Maybe I can move a little bit forward because I think we have, there is just a short time. You have already in the, in the handout this kind of results. So basically, what, from my conclusion, what derives is basically that we have a really flexible index. So I think this can be important also for other applications. And uh, you can play a little bit with the scenarios in order to have different insights from different policy analysis. So I think that this uh, can be a little bit an important improvement in, in the rest of literature uh, with all the respect of for, for sure for other indicators. This is the team. I'm very grateful to the team. I can see Roberta, Luca in this room, Lorenzo, Ramiro, Jacopo for the communication and also the other people involved in this project. Okay, and then you can see the, our website in which you can find all the information. And there will be a methodological rep report to be released soon. I think by the end of the month will be ready and we can available on the website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. You, you probably tried to say too many things in half an hour, but I hope you got some of them, at least some of them. Uh, the floor is open for questions and comments. Uh, 
Thank you for the interesting presentation. I have a couple of uh, questions, uh, curiosity as well. Uh, I was wondering, well, um, to what extent um, you did a comparison of, uh, by using other models, for instance, and, you know, with, with the, the outputs that you got. And moreover, since, since it's not, it has not been shown in here, uh, how did you make the link between the modeling and the indicators, actually? Is it based on GDP and correlations? Um, if so, um, did you account for resources availability within this framework or not? Because I think that in some cases it could be crucial, at least at local scales. And, and also, did you account for the difference in quality of the energy that fu would fuel the economy uh, over the, the next uh, decades in terms of energy input, of, of um, energy return on uh, energy input? Because I think this is a crucial aspect as well. Um, yep, thanks. Okay. 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 Uh, thanks for the questions. Basically, uh, uh, starting from the first question, uh, you are asking if we compare with other models. Uh, to our knowledge, it seems that we are using an explorative approach. So uh, if you are thinking about, for instance, the effect from climate change policy, we can make some comparison. If you look at the, com at the sustainability, we are, we are talking about this today. I think, uh, to my knowledge, to our knowledge, there are no other models that try to go to the future in the same respect. So it's difficult to compare. We make some comparison, as you can see, with, for example, from, with the human development the index. So far, we can do this with other composite index today. Tomorrow is a little bit difficult. If you're aware about some models, please let me know because I will try. We, I'm very happy to compare a little bit this. In terms of, uh, what you were referring is the environmental dimensions in terms of resource availability. We, of course, we did don't link indicators to gross domestic product. We link it to several macroeconomic variables. When you talk about resource variability, variability for instance, yeah, but, but I think the question was different. Uh, you asked how uh, the, the model and the indicators are linked, and then, and the, there is no link. It, it, it's much deeper than that the model produces the indicator. So it's not that on the one hand there are the indicators, on the other hand there are the model. Uh, the model is the one that produces the indicator. So the model is calibrated over the past to produce the indicator, and then the indicators are computed for the future. So there, there is one thing only, which is the model. Okay. How? I mean, you know what is a model? If, if yes, uh, you know that the model is a complicated mathematical structure with many variables. Among the many variables that the model produces, there are the indicators. Okay? That's it. Other questions? Please. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I like this idea of looking forward and actually embedding things in a model because that ensures some consistency uh, between the variables. I have two, there are two questions, and this probably only my, my ignorance here, but uh, one concerns the, the weights that you get from the expert questioning, uh, where you present them with different scenarios and they give their appreciation. Uh, I'm just wondering whether <coughs> that way of getting the weights does not uh, sort of presuppose a, a trade-off between the dimensions that you're looking at, okay? You say, yeah, oh, high GDP, uh, or you'd rather have high GDP or a good environment, uh, especially in a context of sustainability. Uh, uh, and uh, partly this is what we try to get across with this idea of green growth as well. Uh, there may actually be uh, a number of areas where you don't have a trade-off, okay? Where in a, in a way, the only way to grow over longer time is by bringing in the environment, okay? So if you ask someone, you'd rather have uh, you know, higher GDP growth or uh, an, an intact environment, uh, are you not kind of embedding this trade-off into your into your model where m maybe there isn't one at the at the end of the day? But maybe you know this is a, a misunderstanding on my part. The other question I had is uh, when you when you judge sustainability or unsustainability, do you at any point in your model do you have some sort of you know critical levels of uh, 
you know, natural resources or, uh, you know, CO2 concentration or, you know, water quality that, that uh, uh, kicks in and where, you know, there's this sort of discontinuity that would just uh, make uh, a situation not, not variable anymore. Okay, yes, <clears throat> starting from the first, uh, I think that uh, uh, the problem is uh, what you are supposing happens in the reference scenario, because uh, as soon as you have a, a fantastic world, for example, the sustainability I was showing, that uh, in which you may have uh, improvement in both economic, social, environmental respect, of course, uh, we don't have problem. It's not a problem of how we elicit preferences. It's a problem that uh, if there are inherent trade-offs within the scenario we build, it's not a problem of weight, I guess. Because uh, if we can, get, of course, if we can, if we, we ask yeah, yeah, people, in the, the way in which uh, uh, you elicit the weights uh, implicitly contains uh, this kind of trade-off, because you are yeah, asking asking us to compare uh, options uh, in which they what they say is that do I prefer some more uh, environment or less uh, economic growth or vice versa? Yeah, but and, uh, what and, is and, the gain? And, if and this, we ask this implicitly contains some some uh, some trade-offs. Yeah, I don't know whether this has an impact on the results. It's something we can test. But the way in which you ask the question hides a trade-off. Yeah, but there is no gain to ask people what you think if everything works perfectly. I think they do not say, no, I don't like this word. I prefer something that is the trade-off. That's why we don't ask this kind of questions. This implicitly, we know that people will respond, oh, fantastic, everything works well. That's the point. If there are no trade-offs within the scenario, we can assign the best score because we don't have any problem here. That's the point. So we don't, we don't, I, don't think really, I don't really think that is a problem of how we Illicit preference is a problem of scenario. If there are no trade-off, we are all happy. We go at home, no problem. We don't have any policy to support. That's the point. <laughs> this is my view. And uh, the second question was about if there are some discontinuity. Of course, so once you have below or above some thresholds, uh, you don't have any more improvement. For instance, uh, if you if you look, for instance, um, in several countries where gross domestic product is already very high, when you implement the policy you don't have any reduction in uh, gross domestic products because uh, or at least they, they normalized um, the gross domestic product because uh, you say, okay, but uh, for me is maybe cannot be, cannot make a large difference if I have $7,000 per capita or 65. I still am above the, the, the threshold. I'm anyway very happy. So in this case, there is a discontinuity. Even for environmental deterioration, once you have achieved some reduction in or some very huge water pressure, you cannot go still below. You are already achieved the minimum threshold. So your sustainability is exactly zero. So that's the point. Okay. I have a couple of follow-up questions. <clears throat> One of my questions originally was, what explained the fact that uh, the U.S. the difference between the U.S. and China, where the U.S. can accomplish much greater environmental improvement for very limited GDP loss, whereas for China the GDP loss is much higher. So, if I'm understanding correctly from your answer just now, it's because the normalization basically caps the maximum uh, the maximum loss that you could have from from GDP. Right? You, you, as long as you going from very rich to slightly less rich, then you're still in the top category, and it doesn't really show up as a, a difference. So that, that was my question, I, uh, whether I'm interpreting it you right. And the second has to do with the model, and whether in the model you allow for positive feedback loop between environment, environmental variables and growth. Uh, and, or is that just the case for perhaps some of the natural endowments and not for the pressures? Uh, for the first question, uh, partially is what you're saying, but I think is the mechanism of the market. Ch possibly China will suffer, but also the other BRICS also in the Russia, will uh, suffer the highest burden since they have uh, potentially can improve more in terms of technological side. And this is why they can become net sellers of permits. The United States can possibly buy permits from the United States. 
Of course, if you have unilateral targets, it mm. can be different. The, st the story can be completely different. The United States can even lose more than China. It depends how you can see, how you conceive the system, which is the agreement. We do unilateral policy. We do a just a strategy in which we are a fully flexible carbon markets. This is an idea. This can be quite interesting to compare to the different solutions to see if there are some relevant differences. Basically, generally, there you see just we, the, this was circling again. So it seems to be a consistent result that high income countries can improve much better their environmental performance at much lower cost, which, which is the opposite of what you would expect if you had this permit trading. That's why I don't understand it. I think China can do more than U.S. since the technology is more mature in U.S. and Italy and Germany. But they, they, they improve, improve their ranking. I, I, I think that, 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 that what doesn't work in this kind of presentation is that you combine an information based on indicators with an information based on GDP. Because what you are saying is that the, 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 there is a GDP loss which is quite different. and. Uh, uh, the GDP, GDP loss doesn't depend on, on, on normalization, mm -hmm. doesn't depend on all these uh, things that we were, were, were talking about. So it's, it's a real GDP loss. So uh, w the, w your first question is, the answer is no, uh, it doesn't depend on that, because the GDP loss is GDP loss. The problem is that the comparison between a GDP loss and a performance on the environment, for example, which depends on normalization, aggregation, uh, thresholds, benchmarks, and so on okay. and so forth. So, uh, it, whereas the, 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 the information on GDP is a, is a net information, mm -hmm. the other one depends on uh, country-specific condition. Right. So if a country is, is uh, uh, in a situation that leads the country not to move across different, uh, different benchmarks or different uh, position in, in the scale that we use to, to parameterize the, perform the environmental performance, because there the, are the five scales five positions in, in, in the ranking uh, with respect to a given uh, environmental indicator, that if, if this doesn't happen, the, the indicator doesn't change, whereas the GDP changes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we should not mix the two information. I think that the, the GDP information is, is misleading from, the, from this viewpoint. And indeed, if you look at the, uh, the number is here, but if you look at the information uh, through the in, uh, uh, economic indicator and environmental indicators, the situation is, is, is uh, slightly different. Uh, look at this, for example. This is the, uh, there is BRICS, there is not China alone. But, but again, uh, you can see that uh, the GDP has a very negative performance, but not the other indicators. Right. Page six and seven so, of the. Uh, I think that the two things are really not comparable. This is money, and this dollars, billion dollars. These are not billion dollars. These are numbers that yeah, depend these on. These are very different. When yeah. when you look at your economic ranking versus yeah. the GDP, you have a yeah. yeah. Other <laughs> questions, Rima? So, Michele. <coughs> I would also like to compliment you for, for the work done because I had the privilege as well to see the previous version in, in Belpaso. And I, I can tell how much work and effort has been into, this, uh, into the improvement of the index. What I would um, notice is just maybe a couple of points. What is important to look at during the normalization, since you use um, these categories, right? If the value is between tot and tot, you assign the zero or 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and so on. It is very important to look at countries that are really on the intersection of these, hmm? because all of a sudden they can have these huge jumps, but it is just because the value was, you know, very close to that threshold. So it's really important to assess that as well. Um, and the other um, remark relates to a combination of the of two graphs, one where you do show the um, sensitivity analysis. Of, of your country ranking, it is maybe another one, and the the way you show that some countries or groups of countries have improved or deteriorated over the years. If we look at the this the previous graph was the one that I was referring to, and I'm sure the other one will come out. So what you would notice is this is the graph. Mm -hmm. You'd see that for some countries, for several countries, the difference, the impact, is more than uh, uh, at the first decimal already. So it's from zero three to zero five. If you look uh, at how the country groups would improve over these 15 years, you'll see that the difference is at the second decimal. And therefore, it's uh, really important to complement the graph 
whether these changes, whether these improvements or deterioration are really statistically different because in, in a graph, uh, they may look as if something is moving, but if you see it in the whole picture, the differences may not be significant. So it's really important wherever you can tell uh, the difference, just to notice that. Um. Yeah, th this is a good suggestion, and, and indeed, uh, in, uh, I don't know whether in this report, but in the previous report, rather than having a ranking for individual country, we had a rank for group of countries, mm -hmm. where the groups were designed in a way that uh, the group was robust to changes. <coughs> so the, in that group, the sensibility, an the sensitivity analysis was not able to move uh, countries to a different group. They were not able to jump up or, or, or below that, that group. So th this was a more robust representation because rather than having an individual country ranking, you have just groups of countries that belong to the same kind of uh, sustainability, mm -hmm. the, uh, sustainable development. Uh, of course, then uh, um, media f don't like this. They rather like mm -hmm. to say, well, are you first or, uh, or uh, fifth <laughs> or twentieth, uh, rather than belonging to a group of, say, five countries that perform. But, I mean, as you said, uh, it's more correct to, to, to work for, for groups of countries. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, and, and I was not suggesting not to report the country ranking because media likes it and, and you definitely need to have something. More, it was referring to where you show whether a group of countries improved over these 15 years, is, is expected to improve or deteriorate over the next years up to 2030. And there you see the small differences at the second decimal. Visually, there seems to be a here. So if visually there seems to be a change, but <clears throat> that might not be significant. Right. So just to add this one, but of course I agree with you. Other questions? Uh, it's uh, 1.03, so we are three minutes late, but you still have time for more questions? No? Let me then thank you, all of you, all those uh, on the web. Thank you in particular, the, the, let me thank the, the speakers, the four speakers of, uh, of this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, quite interesting, a lot of good suggestions, a lot of work uh, to be done for the next year and the next uh, uh, couple of years to further improve the, at least our own, uh, our own model and our own work. And I hope to do it in collaboration with, with all of you. So let me thank you again. Thank you. So lunch is served outside for those who want to remain.